Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> Just before 10, but since everyone's quiet and ready, commissioners, are you all ready to proceed? Um, so, my name is John Carvelli, and on behalf of the California State Athletic Commission, I would like to call this meeting Tuesday, December 12, 2017, to order. I begin by pledging allegiance to our flag. Dr. Williams, would you please, yes, sir? Pledge, please, sir. Mr. Foster, Mr. Duke, Mr. Foster, would you please call the roll and establish a quorum for us? Yes, sir. Uh, Chairman Carvelli? Here. Vice Chairman Lehman? Here. Commissioner Senior Quidez? Here. Commissioner Souter? Here. Commissioner and Dr. Williams? Here. Mr. Chairman, we have a quorum. Uh, Commissioner Farson and Commissioner Ayell are absent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, once again, good morning to you all. It's an opportunity for me to make a couple of remarks, but uh, I've, I've opted for a, a year-end statement today. It'll be brief, and I'm going to read it because I'm not good at rem remembering things I write. Um, I'm proud to say that I know, and on behalf of my colleagues here, this commission is fiscally sound, efficiently and effectively administered, and is, in my humble opinion, the regulatory example both on a national and international basis, providing dynamic and common sense leadership in all aspects of combat sports. Pretty good, huh, so far? Pretty good. Um, I suggest to you all, everyone that's listening, that the year 2017 will represent uh, the year of the 10-point plan. 10-point plan that addresses severe dehydration, weight cutting, and of course, uh, weight gaining. This plan is conceived and implemented by this executive officer, Andy Foster, and this commission. This plan has also been approved nationally by the Association of Boxing Commissions and is now being implemented by various states, with more states to come, I'm sure, and also foreign countries. The 10-point plan has and will fulfill our clear mission to protect and defend the health and safety of combat athletes. This plan will save lives. And so on behalf of my colleagues, I ask God and the 10-point plan to keep our fighters safe and also extend our best holiday wishes to our CSAC family. Thank you all very much. There you go. Okay, agenda item number three. We'll start with the approval of the October 17, 2017 commission meeting minutes. Mr. Foster, do you have any comments? Do we have a motion to approve the minutes? No? So I'll need a motion to approve these minutes, please. So moved. Commissioner Sauter. Uh, second. Second. Second, Commissioner Shanakidis. Comments, Commissioner Martha. Yeah, I just have a couple of revisions under agenda item three. Um, in the third line, after that USA, the USA Boxing sent a delegate from Colorado Springs to advise the commission as to what the status, the, the word status is missing with their organization. And then two lines down where it says, going on with the International Boxing Association, parentheses, uh, originally known as AIBA, parentheses. Can make those corrections, please? Do you have any further <coughs> comments? I don't think so. I think that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, there's just two um, uh, typos, but I don't want to get them. Okay, on agenda item three under public comment, uh, complimented is misspelled. It should have an I. And, um, 
on page five under IKEA, uh, the second uh, full paragraph, the the third to last sentence that because Mr. Foster responded that E.O. Foster was, and I think the word the should be deleted, so it, I believe it's supposed to read, was following the guidelines on his end. So allow us to disabuse you if any of you think we're not paying attention. We're paying attention. Excellent, excellent minutes again. Yeah, well done, thank you. I worked very hard to find any little error. <laughs> We're going to have a perfect set in 2018. That's the goal. <laughs> I think you have it, actually. <laughs> Dr. Williams, anything? No. Commissioner Sauter? Okay. Uh, we can welcome any comments or corrections to our minutes from the public. If I don't see anybody wanting to speak on this. And so, why don't we call for approval? Please call the roll. Chairman Carvelli? Aye. Vice Chair Lehman? Aye. Commissioner Senior Quidez? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner and Dr. Williams? Aye. Five zero, sir. Thank you. Agenda item number four, an update from the Department of Consumer Affairs. We have with us the director, Dean Grafilo, former colleague, a friend. Mr. Director, good morning and thanks for coming. <coughs> good morning to you all and thanks for having me. Always a pleasure to visit uh, what I have said publicly, and I'll say again, it will always uh, be one of the programs at TCA that ranked the highest, um, uh, given my history with the Athletic Commission. I think uh, my colleague, Chris Castrillo, is going to join me, too. First, uh, let me say that, uh, again, I hope um, I mentioned uh, to some of you before we officially start, hopefully friends and family are safe. Uh, from the fires down in Southern California. Um, very familiar with um, some of the work that DCA does specifically, the Contractor State Licensing Board does in assisting those affected. And um, I had some early, I was on some early emails about the efforts uh, with CSLB specific to the ones down in Southern California. Again, so, uh, again, so hopefully uh, friends or family are in fact safe down in Southern California as well. And I'd be remiss just given um, it's obviously December. I would like to wish all of you, you know, happy holidays. Looking forward to, um, yes, like you were alluding to, um, talking about the great things that happened in 2017 and folding that into 2018, whether it be the 10-point plan, 10-point planner or otherwise. Um, again, you always have a a truly, truly invested partner in terms of advancing the mission of CSAC. Uh, while I'm, as long as uh, I'm director at TCA. Um, Chairman Carvelli, Vice Chair Lehman, Executive, of Executive Officer Foster, thank you for allowing me this opportunity to provide a department update to the Athletic Commission. <clears throat> in the near nine months as Director of DCA, I feel for very fortunate to serve in a position that align well with my values and while, all while protecting California's consumers. First, I'd like to report some staffing changes at the department. As many of you may know, Ms. Christine Lawley, who previously served as Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Relations, has joined the Medical Board as its Deputy Director. While, I, while the Department and I are deeply sad to see Ms. Lawley go, I know that she's going to be able to continue to do great, great things at the Medical Board, and I know that uh, she isn't uh, too far away, just given the, that she is, in fact, at the Medical Board. In addition, the Department has welcomed a new Chief Deputy Director, Chris Schultz, a new Deputy Director of Administration, Natalie Daniel, and a new Deputy Director of Board and Bureau Services, a gentleman to my right, Chris Castrillo. Before coming to DCA, Chief Deputy Schultz was the Deputy Commissioner of Community Programs and Policy <coughs> Initiatives at the California Department of Insurance since 2011. Ms. Daniel has been a Fiscal Supervisor at the Judicial Council of California since 2015. She will be overseeing the, department, the department's Office of Human Resources, Business Services Offices, and Fiscal Operations. Mr. Castrillo, as I noted, is here to help provide, to help provide today's update, and I'll give an opportunity to, to introduce himself in a moment. I'm delighted to welcome our newest team members. I'm confident that these staff additions will strengthen our ability to pursue the, depart, the department's mission and services we provide to our various boards and bureaus. 
I hope you can join me in providing them with a warm welcome, either when you um, directly come across them or obviously uh, with today. Specific to the um, most recent director's meeting in uh, September, the department held the second director's quarterly meeting with Board of Executive Officers. These quarterly meetings are an opportunity to, to ensure that the department continues an open dialogue with its boards and bureaus. To that end, we will still be holding an annual meeting with all board presidents to ensure that I'm available to you and that I can hear feedback from board leadership on the important issues facing the department and its various boards and bureaus. With that, I want to thank you for your continued partnership and the work that you do to protect California's consumers. For the next updates, I'll turn it over to Mr. Chris Castrillo, our new Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services. Thank you. Okay, thanks Dean. Um, good morning, as Dean mentioned, I'm Chris Castrillo, I'm the new Deputy Director for Board and Bureau Services. Uh, pleased for the opportunity to meet you all. I've had the opportunity to sit down uh, with your Executive Officer and learn, learn about CSAC and really excited to get the opportunity to be working with everybody here. Uh, a little bit about myself, I come to DCA with a background in public policy and campaign management. Uh, most recently worked as a legislative advocate uh, across the street, spent a lot of time over here in the Capitol, actually in this hearing room. Uh, worked on local government, youth mental health, foster care, health care, um, public transportation, just to name a few. Uh, I've also worked on candidate and initiative campaigns um, up in California, and here in California, and then up in Oregon as well. Uh, so new to the DCA family, but I'm really looking forward to applying my experience and my skill set uh, to establishing an office of Board and Bureau Services that implements our strategic plan, exemplifies organizational effectiveness, and provides relevant, timely, and accurate information to all of our stakeholders. Uh, with respect to the Office of Board and Bureau Services, Dean mentioned some staff changes earlier. A couple of additional staff changes. The Office of Board and Bureau Services uh, is expanding. We have two new Assistant Deputy Directors. They are in uh, the audience here today. Uh, Karen Nelson and Patrick Lee, excuse me. Uh, Ms. Nelson has been the Chief Operations Officer at the American Leadership Forum Mountain Valley Chapter since 2014, and Mr. Lee has been Assistant Chief of External Affairs at Covered California since 2015. We can have them say hello. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Hi, you two. Um, thank you, welcome. Thank you. Uh, so the department's confident these staff additions will strengthen our ability to pursue the department's mission and the services we provide our various boards and bureaus and commissions. And I hope you can provide, uh, join me in providing them with a warm welcome. So thank you for that. Uh, a couple of quick updates aside from staffing changes. Uh, the DCA leadership, on DCA leadership training, the department officially launched its new uh, future leadership development program in May of 2017. The kickoff meeting with program participants and mentors was in August 2017. Um, the last meeting was in this past October and it featured uh, Senator Jerry Hill. This program expands on the department's current leadership academy training, and the department is looking to develop the best and brightest amongst the department, its boards, bureaus, and commissions uh, into its future leaders. The program includes executive mentoring, customized leadership training, and project management. I've had the opportunity to sit in on a couple of them. It's a fantastic program and a, and a great way that we're um, encouraging the growth and new leaders within the department, so we're very excited about that. Uh, quick note on pro rata. The department's established a pro rata work group we, um, your executive officer, is, is a part of. Um, it's made up of DCA and board executives to discuss potential improvements and how DCA communicates with boards, bureaus, and commissions on this issue. Um, as you all know, pro rata is the process by which the department distributes the costs amongst its boards and bureaus uh, to cover all departmental services, information technology, legal, publications, legislative review, et cetera. Uh, the work group met in August, in October, and we hosted our third meeting last week. We also had a pro rata open house in November, late November, um, and that gave an opportunity for board bureau commission leadership uh, to meet the various departments, divisions, learn a little bit more about what those divisions do, and of course, the, the individuals who staff those divisions. Uh, quick note on required trainings. We have just set the dates for the 2018 uh, board member orientation trainings. As you may know, um, this is a required training within one year of appointment and reappointment to a board. Uh, the first one of the year is gonna be scheduled for March 21st. We'll have another one on June 6th, September 18th, and December 5th. Don't worry about memorizing those. 
We are going to email those dates out and make sure you all have them at your ready in case you need to attend one of these required trainings. Um, lastly, on trainings, 2017 is a required uh, sexual harassment tr uh, prevention training year for the department. This means that all DCA employees and board members are required to complete this training in 2017, even if it was completed last year. Uh, the training is online, interactive, and can be completed at your convenience. Uh, if you have any questions about any of these trainings, please don't hesitate to reach out to our office, as I noted above. I have myself and our two new assistant deputies, and we're all really, really excited to get the opportunity to work with the boards and, and make sure all of your needs are taken care of. Um, so with that, just want to make sure you all know the department is committed to serving its boards and bureaus. I think Dean mentioned uh, most of the consumer protection value we're able to provide as a department comes from its board bureaus and commissions. So we really look forward to working with you. Just want to thank you for your partnership and uh, looking forward to 2018 already. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. See you soon. So, agenda item number five review and update on the commission's budget with the DCA budget staff. Shall we let the de director and deputy leave before we <laughs> start on that? No, they're going to stay. Mr. Foster. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, Taylor Schick and Mark Ito. Uh, are, are with us uh, today. Mark is assigned to the commission's, uh, he's the commission's budget analyst at the department and not sure exactly Taylor's official title, but Taylor's like the head of the budget department. Over I'm the there. fiscal officer for the department. So the fiscal office, both the county and the cashier. And right. Thank you, Taylor. We've obviously had you help us before, so good to see you both. Thank you. Gentlemen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's good to see everyone again. My name is Mark Ito. I'm the budget analyst, as Andy said, over uh, the commission. And I'm joined by Taylor Schick, the fiscal officer for the Department of Consumer Affairs. Um, all programs under, the, under DCA participate in incremental budgeting. This means that the starting point for the building of each year's budget is the prior year's budget act, budget act, which was approved by the governor. From there, various current year and budget year adjustments were made. These are the results of budget letters, executive orders, budget change proposals, et cetera. The governor's budget will be released on January 10th, and your, and your new budget will be, will, will be released at that time. In regards to your current year expenditures and revenue, um, the commission estimates that approximately $900,000 in revenue will be, will, will be collected in the first six months of this year. So if this trend continues, uh, your, annual, your annual revenue will be approximately $1.8 million. The department is working with Fiscal to get expenditure reports for this fiscal year, and we anticipate beginning to receive these reports soon. <laughs> However, we do anticipate that the commission is currently spending within their appropriation. Ah, good to yeah. know. And one good thing of note here is uh, starting this fiscal year, the commission has budget bill language that allows the commission to increase their current year appropriation by up to $250,000 to adequately staff events. So although you don't have your budget reports at this time, um, there is kind of a safety net if you overexpend your inspector line item um, that you'll be able to do a current year augmentation. What was, what was last year's total? Uh, last, year's, last year's revenue or? Yeah, the, the our spending authority last year was. Um, was 1.6, 1.63, 1.626, so something like that. We would add about 250,000 to that if we needed to, okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. And one more uh, thing of note, I'm in constant communication with Andy. We talk regularly, a couple times a week usually, just to make sure that we're um, going to meet our budget expenditures and revenues. So I just want to make note of that. Um, and at this time, I welcome any questions you may have. Yeah, so you said you, uh, you speak with Mr. Foster a couple times a week. Is mm -hmm. that just because we don't have any fiscal reports, or is that even when we have reports you know it, it it could be it's it, it's a variety of conversations we have it could be anything about the reports to how our, our revenues do in expenditures events um i like to be in contact with andy just because uh your budget is a little more volatile than others where where you do everything's kind of based on your events and what you're doing with your inspectors and drug testing etc 
Additionally, uh, Vice Chair Layman, is all the regulations have to be signed off by the budget office that have fiscal impact, so that requires constant, a lot of communication back and forth. And as the commissioners know, we've ran quite a few reg packages recently. So am I understanding that you were saying that for the upcoming year, we have spending authority pretty much equal to our projected revenue? Yeah, so it, it's pretty balanced, your, your revenue and expenditures. Okay. And we still have our reserve, which is six, nine months. Yeah, Andy's done a really good job increasing the reserves over the last five or six years. I estimate it's about a million dollars right now. Yeah. 980000 to one fifty. Some That's my estimates without any expenditure reports. That's where I think we're at. And um, so you said we expect the fiscal report soon, um, time frame for soon, or you don't want to be pinned down on that? So unfortunately, I don't want to promise anything too soon, but we have been working di uh, diligently with both the State Controller's Office, Department of Finance, and the uh, Fiscal staff on ensuring that we're able to <coughs> produce accurate reports out of the system. Right now, we're hoping to do our first month end close in mid-December, so I am targeting next week. Uh, there are a couple outstanding issues that we are having, some very technical ones with interface issues with uh, the Fiscal system that we're working with Fiscal staff. And I do understand the frustration in not getting reports out in a timely manner as we used to have under CalSTARS. So while we are in budget building right now, all staff within the budget office are going to be preparing essentially what are manual reports. The, the issue with Fiscal is just, you know, all the information is being entered. You're still collecting revenue. Revenue is still coming into your fund. Uh, invoices are still being paid. Everything's being collected, but that central repository of information right now, we aren't able to generate those reports. So in lieu of those reports and what we'll have prepared for Andy if we're not able to get a first report out is going to be a manual reporting, a manual projection. We have all the information. We know what you've expended for personnel services. We know what your rent schedule is. We know uh, all of your contracts and we can track down those invoices. So it takes a little bit more work because we're going to have to do it manually outside of the system until it can actually unfortunately spit out the reports but we'll be able to provide a manual projection for you. And we're hoping to provide that to Andy um, early in January. Um, also early in January is when um, myself personally and all the budget analysts will go out and meet with programs to go over uh, the governor's budget, what changes were made um, from 17, 18 into 18, 19, and just looking at how the budget changed and other things to look out for in the future. And that's usually the first month where we really do a detailed uh, look at the expenditure projections because it's the midway point in the year. Unfortunately, with the transition to fiscal, we don't have the true fiscal reports. So we'll have a manual projection based on all actuals, and we'll have all the backup detail for all the information that we're putting into that projection. Mm -hmm. And you're pretty sure that the manual will be as accurate? The manual should be as accurate because everything that's being entered into the system comes from other source documents. Mm -hmm. It's just that through the system, yeah, not to get too technical, there's various modules in the system. So there's an accounting module, a cashiering module, a budget manual. They all have to be closed in sequence in order to run a month end report. Um, we're having some difficulty with some of the interfaces right now, but we anticipate those to be resolved shortly and we're hoping to get the first month out, um, as I mentioned, hopefully within the next week in December. And once we have that first month under our belt and we've ironed out all the issues, especially in the transition to a new IT system, we'll be able to close all the other months in quick succession. Okay. Thank you so much. Commissioners, do you have uh, questions? Yes. Here you are. Commissioner Martin. So, thank you for coming. So exactly a year ago we sat here and we talked about the budget and I would like to revisit that because exactly a year ago my concern, and I think all of our concerns were, that we don't participate in our budget process. And just, and I get that the Department of Consumer Affairs can say, listen, we're just gonna take your entire budget for pro rata or whatever it is, and we appreciate that you don't because we need to participate. But for the sake of fairness and predictability, we need to be able to say, 
what it is we, need, we have to operate with for the coming whatever years. And so a year ago, the chairman asked that we be able to participate in some meetings ahead of time for our budgetary process and not just be told what our spending authority is going to be. And a year ago, you advised us that perhaps January would be a good time for us to start this discussion. And so came January, we asked to participate because the year before we were just told in the last second half of the year that our pro rata was gonna increase by something like $180,000. That is a big increase for a small commission like us. And we don't have the ability to prepare for something like that. Understanding that DCA can do whatever it wants. So came the first quarter, we were not able to somehow set up a meeting. So I'm going to ask again, whether it's Andy, whether it's the chairman, whether it's the vice chairman, we really need for fairness and predictability to be able to participate in somehow understanding going forward how it is that our budget is going to be arrived at because if we don't understand that, we are not going to be able to determine what our line items are, how we're gonna spend, and, and this is a commission which has to deal with the health and safety of a whole bunch of people. So we would really appreciate it if we could participate at some level in that. That's the first thing. The second thing is I am somewhat concerned with this entire fiscal thing because I really knew nothing about it until come July of this year, it rolled out for DCA and then we didn't have any documentation, didn't have any documentation and it didn't have any documentation. And then as it turns out, this is really like a year off <laughs> the rollout that it was supposed to be and then we're told it's going to be another month, it's going to be another month, it's going to be another month. And in writing, in October, the first quarter documentation was supposed to come out in November, and it isn't, and it's still the transitioning, and it's still the transitioning. And I'm thinking if you could have done it manually last month, or the month before, the month before, then perhaps it should have already been done. So I'm concerned because According to everything that I read, there are some fairly large issues, and I don't understand whether it's an Accenture issue, whether it's a technical issue, whether it's a whole lot of things put together issues. There, and you guys have a lot of commissions and a lot of boards that you really have to integrate together. And now that we've gone, or you've gone, or they've gone from a wave deployment to a release deployment, which is a lot more flexible, and apparently it's like 14 months behind at a minimum on the wave or the release three deployment and another four or five months off on the release four deployment, which is like 70 departments on the left. And then it's now like the strategic plan goes through 2021. And we're very concerned because we're still under, you know, kind of sunset review. And it hasn't been that long since we were in a whole lot of trouble with our budget and our spending authority. So, I mean, I will take some crayons and put this <laughs> manually ourselves. If you tell us we're really not going to be able to put this together manually next month, then we will start making plans to do this manually ourselves. But we really need to know because it's been month to month to month to month. And we get that it's not your issue. It's like a whole big issue. But if this is a real issue, then please let us know because we could probably start doing this ourselves on an Excel spreadsheet. You know what I mean? Because it's going on six months and it's a problem for us. No, so I definitely appreciate your concerns. Um, I'll try to tackle them in the order uh, that you presented them. So the first one I know we did meet last year and you expressed the concerns, uh, number one about uh, the Parada and I will, I want to do clarify that the increase in Parada was not 
uh, DCA Parada, but rather statewide Parada. But I do agree with you. Um, in the past, when those changes have been rolled out, they're not typically informed to you during the budget building process, but rather once the governor's budget is released. One of the steps that the department has taken and that um, Chief Deputy Castrillo actually um, touched on is we created a Parada work group that actually um, Commissioner Foster is a part of. And he actually brings a lot of these points that you mentioned to that work group. Um, one of the primary messages that we've talked about is uh, providing a more transparent system, not only for departmental prorata, but also knowing what changes are occurring during the governor's budget uh, building process. One of the things that does hamstring us slightly there is while I want to get that information out, um, it is confidential until it is released at Jan 10, uh, but that doesn't mean that we can't share it partially with the commission as long as we know that that won't be shared publicly. So that's one of the caveats there. We're not allowed to release that information publicly, but we can share with you. So one of the discussions we actually had at the last work group was creating a better <coughs> system to roll out those changes as they occur. The changes don't always occur well in advance. Sometimes we start the development of the governor's budget for 1819. We're really starting in August. Some of the rollout of those adjustments don't happen until September, October, even as late as November or December. But we are looking at a way to once we've finalized those adjustments and we've worked it out, you know, all of these adjustments are typically done under the strict confines of a budget letter that's issued by Department of Finance with very specific instructions on how you structure those adjustments. But once we have those adjustments and they're approved by the Department of Finance, we're looking at a better way to roll those out to all the boards and bureaus so they know in advance of the uh, governor's budget release of what those impacts are going to be. But this was in addition to that. This, was, this came very late in the year. I mean, we had a pro rata and this was like, so, and, and this is even in addition to the pro rata. So I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it's just, you know, the general budget and the line items in the budget. And this is, you know, it's not really even a budget. It's our own spending authority and what, you, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So it's in addition to that. And that is not, is not a secret. It's our own, it's, what, you know, we eat what we kill is what we make and what we can spend in terms of whatever it is, our office things. and our, So it's even in addition to the pro rata. So I think that's something that should be a, a participatory kind of, you know, overall. Um, but having said that, I understand what you're saying. So um, we have been working with Foster in those meetings to try to roll out a better system um, I will say, unfortunately, on some of the drills, um, while we could have you participate, they really are um, sort of driven by numbers. They're driven by reports that come out from SEO, so we don't have ability or flexibility to change it. But if you do want to be or see and have more transparency in the process, uh, we'd be happy to walk through exactly what we did. Uh, the other adjustments outside of uh, both statewide and departmental per rata are typically adjustments for in um, retirement rate increases. So as that percentage increases for what the state contributes towards <coughs> every employee's retirement rate, we make that adjustment and it's driven by a percentage based on a, you know, organizational charts that's provided by the state controller's office as of the 1st of July. So we can try to roll those out if you'd like to see what the process is by which we make those calculations. But the one thing we do want to provide is a better process by which when we know what those adjustments are going to be, we're relaying them to Commissioner Foster so he's aware of what those are going to well, be those, prior to January. Those are important because when you increase those things, we, we don't increase, let's say, our revenue stream. They just stay the same. And if you're increasing, let's say, civil service, whatever it is, then it's, it's entirely <coughs> possible that we have to increase our revenue stream to meet that. Maybe not. But we do have to sometimes think about making adjustments if that increases, you know, whether it's the health, whether it's whatever the retirement, what, because after all we have to plan ahead in order to meet that, because if that begins, begins to increase and our revenue stream is still down here, then it's going to eat us up at some point. And I do want to just clarify, I mean, it's not the department that's saying, hey, we want you to pay X amount more for your salaries. Those are driven by bargaining unit agreements and other things that are happening throughout the year. But I do agree that once we know what those adjustments are going to be, they need to be relayed. Well, we have to have that predictability is what I'm saying. But if, if we're always being told after the fact, and it's not just, I'm saying there are boards and commissions which do participate in their 
spending authority and in the budgetary process. I just don't want to be, I just don't want to think that our commission is always told after the fact, this is, this is what you're spending authority, and we are. We are the, you know, one of those. This is what you get to spend. We would rather be in the process ahead of time so that there's discussion. This is what I'm saying. I'd like, I'd like to make a suggestion here. What, what has been very helpful to me is traveling up here to meet with these folks in person, in their offices, with some time to go through this in detail. There's no way you're going to get the answers we're looking for, I think, in this setting right now. But it's been very helpful to me to sit with them, take time, go through notes, and, and so I, I recommend that. And I'm sure that you would be available to meet with any of the commissioners like you were for me. My request, and I'm sure Andy would attend with you and you could have an agenda and go through this stuff in more detail. You might learn more than you bargained for <laughs> and find, find that you'll be more frustrated as you <laughs> after you leave. But So if I could suggest that soon, that you could, you know, sometime soon when you get back. Okay. Good, great. So we could do that. Thank you. That would be great. Commissioners, do you have anything else for these gentlemen? Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. It's a lot of information. We'll, we'll look forward to that manual report <coughs> or, or, or electronic know. report. Or, or let us know that yeah. it's not coming yes. so that we can prepare. Okay. Agenda item number six. Review and possible action of petition to change the decision for Michael Guy versus Junior Young and Bout on July 29, 2017 in Long Beach, California. Mr. Foster. Yes, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Guy is here. Um, we got this a little bit before we uh, actually had our formal process for the uh, change of decision, but once we, once we st started with that, we tried to follow all of the steps, uh, as you can probably see in your handout. Um, so everyone that needed to be... Mr. Guy, hang on one second. Where will they be able to uh, sit and talk to us? Uh, just uh, Heather's just going to do the computer okay. to show the film, and Mr. Guy can sit right here. Okay, gentlemen, just hang on a second. We'll call you up in a minute. We'll set this up. But please do listen because we have, you know, the kind of guidelines that we follow for this kind of thing. So I'm sorry they were standing behind you. So, um, Okay, go ahead. So, um, Mr. Guy, um, there was three instances in the fight where he claims the referee did not indicate knockdowns uh, that were should have been credited to him against uh, Mr. Yonan, and uh, he he believes that those knockdowns could have changed the outcome of the fight. Mr. Guy's in blue. Blue trunks. Good. Yeah, just let them see that it's better to get the context of the fight.
There is one. You want to narrate? Feel free. I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here in silence. You know? Okay. That that was the that was the first one. Okay. First one what? The the first one that Mr. Guy is disputing that should have been a knockdown. So the referee called it a slip. Yes, sir. Andy, provide information for us. Please. Oh, okay. Heather, you want to go to the next one? Obviously, that was a, that was a, uh, no, yeah, right. Heather, if you can fast forward to the next one. Same throw down or another throw down? That's the same one. It's replaying it. It's replaying it, sir. There's the there's the other one. Okay. I think it's best to let Mr. Guy. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah. Present, please. Mr. Guy. Turn the lights back on. Thank you. Another information you give us. Please come and sit down, Mr. Guy. If you gentlemen would introduce yourselves. Hello, I'm Michael Guy. Use the microphone. Use the microphone, please. Thank you. And Mike, we can play the video again if you, if you want to walk them through it yourself. There's quite a bit there, Andy. Okay, you, you, then, you, then it's your video. Before you they know. start, welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Um, we're happy to hear what you have to say, as much information as you can provide. Have you been advised of, of what the rules are and how we do things here? Well, By these gentlemen, the Mr. Duke and Mr. Foster? Or as what, sir? Just the, the, the kind of, we're not a court of law, as you, as you well know, yeah, right? Yeah. Okay, sure. you, you can have your say and we can. We, we, we appreciate it. Okay, all right. So, so let's start by, you introduce yourselves and then tell us what you have to say. Okay, um, we appreciate, as I said earlier. Just, uh, Please introduce yourselves. My name is Norm Tavalero, and I'm one of the trainers uh, for Mike uh, Guy and Ace Johnson is the other trainer, he was back there. In fact, he was at the fight. Uh, with Mike, I wasn't. I don't travel anymore. So, uh, Mike is my guy. And Michael guy. Okay. Um, we have the video of the fight, and uh, other than what you guys had, that uh, that jumped off all over a couple of different things, aspects of it. This was provided by Mr. Guy. So. We don't want to start on the first round, that's boring. We'll just go on through. We're particularly interested in the seventh. Speak right into the mic. We're basically interested in the seventh round and eighth round. And um, um, if we could pause when we get to that point, uh, we'd like to point out some things for you that we think are relevant. And uh, uh, they should have been, that would have changed the scoring on the fight totally. Um, and um, that's something that we wanted to bring up. And um, if we could get to that point in the fight, it would be probably save you a lot of time. Can you get that, Mike? So you saw the first knockdown that was that came approximately at one. Uh, one minute and seven seconds left in the seventh round. When Mike hit him with five punches in a row, and Mr. Yonan did not deliver any type of punch back. And he laid his 
buttocks went against the ropes. He would have gone down if not for the ropes. And, and, he, uh, and he fell to the ground and he crawled to the, crawled to the ropes to get up. Usually when a guy gets, if a guy gets hit and he's not stunned or anything else, he won't crawl to the ropes to help himself up. He'll just get right back up. And if you'll watch, he, he crawled to the ropes. He looked a little glazed, glassy-eyed when he got up. And that was in round seven. The other position that we're looking at is in round eight, uh, with, with about one point, one, one minute, 29 seconds left in the eighth round. He was against the ropes, he avoided a left hook, then got hit with a right hand and a left hook to the body. He went down, Mr. Yonan did. There, right there, he went down. They call that a slip, okay? So then, um, he also went down with approximately 23 seconds left in the round, when he avoided a big right hand and went to his knee to avoid a punch. So if you study the videos, you can place two slips in the category of falling to the canvas to avoid further punishment, plus the big knockdown in round seven. Now these punches were landed by Mr. Guy. And one of the things that I might point out to the commission is that when, when Mr. Guy hit Mr. Yonan with those punches, Mr. Guy was standing in approximately the same position Mr. Yonan was. He was close enough to him. They had the same shoes on. Mr. Yonan slips. Mr. Guy doesn't. Doesn't make sense. Mr. Guy. What, what would you have us do? So well, we, what, I, what I also tried to, to make it clear on this right here, um, just to make it clear that it was a um, knockdown and not a slip, I even stood back and, and not touched him to make it clear that nothing was touching him and he still went down. They also said that was a slip. Yeah. You got two slips, two slips and a... And a okay. You're disagreeing with the referee. We're disagreeing with this definitely ruling with two slips. You're saying that they were both knockdowns. Yeah, when, yeah. and when I threw the, the, the five unanswered punches, um, he was trying to go down. I can feel he was trying to go down, but the <coughs> was holding his butt, so he turned his legs, you know, clockwise to be able to go down to avoid taking any more shots. And then at that time, then he crawled to the ropes, crawled, helped himself up on the ropes, and then got to the ref. That was 10 seconds of no action. Um, That's the seventh round. Yes. What, you said, yeah, what Mr. Guy's saying is he, Mr. Yonan got 10 seconds to recuperate and not to, uh, to, to escape any punishment at that point in time. Uh, one of the things that, that's, that when you look at what's ruled a knockdown, any referee or anyone that's been around boxing, you know, it, it, the rule says that it can be ruled a knockdown when as a result of a legal blow or blows, or a series of blows, a contestant touches the canvas with any part of his body other than his feet. Well, Mr. Yonan touched the canvas three times, and not one of them was called a knockdown. And like I said, Mr. Mr. You're including that throwdown, though, right? Pardon me? No, That's no we're not including, including that. No, sir, we're not contesting that. So why, do you, why do we keep seeing that one? Just in there? I don't know. It was just in there. Okay. Not, right. That's not that's not part of what we're contesting. Okay. We're only contesting the fact that that, the, that it was kind of blatant. I thought where they, they Mike hits this guy with five shots and they're clean, and his he, he's right there. He gets the ropes, and then he goes down, and they don't call that a knockdown. That alone would have changed the score on all of them. Because that would make it a two-point round for Mike, and even though the even though they didn't give him maybe the first round, the the scoring went uh, <coughs> 76, 75, 76, 75 for Mr. Yonan. That would have changed that whole that whole uh, 
statue right there, I would have changed the whole thing. Just if there was one knockdown, that well, would change If the there result. was only one knockdown, it changes it. It either changes it to a draw or Mike wins by one point. It could have been a two point knockdown. Okay. So we have in our memo here that your request is that. Is what? Why don't you tell us? Under Rule 368. Okay. Change the decision. Change the decision. Yes. Okay. We'd like to see that. It, it's going to be beneficial to Mike down the road. He's Mike's getting in the twilight of his career here. He's trying to get into the top well, that, 20. That, that's not part of our deliberation, okay. but Mine. we appreciate that's your right. career. But, All right. So, um, Mr. Foster, before we open up to commissioner questions here, uh, do we have folks that were there? The inspector, inspector, referee, anybody? Yes, sir. Um, I have a uh, I have a letter um, from the referee. Now, it didn't come in in time or per our process. I'm certainly uh, willing to read it to you with your permission, sir. This is from the referee. Yeah, we want to hear it, please. Um, dear Mr. Foster, I'm writing this letter at the request. Um, from whom? This is from the, this is from the, the this is from um, uh, Hedgepath. Mr. Hedgepath. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, we're on the record, gentlemen. Let's, okay. let's be a little this more specific. From the referee, Name names. Okay. from Wayne Hedgepath. Yeah. Uh, in response to the fights held on Saturday, J July 29th, 2017, at the Queen Mary Ship in Long Beach, California, I was assigned to referee the fight featuring uh, Junior Yonan versus Mike uh, Guy. The middleweights during this fight both fighters had to be warned several times regarding their violation of boxing ring rules initially both fighters committed rabbit punching fouls that appeared to be initiated by my guy once i issued warnings both appeared to respond and stop the second foul was again initiated by my guy when he rushed in and used his head and upper body to pin boxer yonan against the ropes in the ring corners Again, after I separated the fighters, I momentarily stopped the action and warned Mr. Guy about his wrestling fouls. I admonished him, and this was a boxing contest, not a wrestling match. During several soft warnings regarding Guy's use of wrestling tactics, I deducted a point for his continual uh, commitment of flagrant fouls. At this time, I became aware that the chief second assistant, Mr. Guy's corner, started shouting loud objections to my warning their fighter. And as the rounds progressed, their shouting increasingly became argumentative and belligerent. Additionally, the chief second could be heard instructing Mr. Guy uh, out loud to act aggressively and to forget the referee. The actions and behavior exhibited by the chief second was unprofessional with the potential to incite violence. At the conclusion of the fight and announcement of the winner, the coach working the corner of Mike Guy used his index finger as a gesture to convey the expletive F U prior to leaving the ring. In retrospect, Mike Guy should have been disqualified in round seven when he wrestled and pushed his opponent to the ring canvas. Lastly, I would like to once again state our, uh, that our more uh, a senior referee should be given credit and consideration um, uh, uh, when inspector supervisors issue assignments. should be given credit and consideration when inspector supervisors issue assignments. He's, he's, he's off of the not guy thing. He's <coughs> going to change gears. Okay, that's from the referee Wayne Hedgepath. That's from the referee Wayne Hedgepath. And do um, so you have something in here in our book from the lead inspector? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you aware of the lead inspector's response, gentlemen? No, we're not. Could you read that then, please, Andy? Real quick? Yes, sir. Uh, to whom it may concern, uh, I was the lead inspector at the Roy Engelbrecht promotion held at Queen Mary in Long Beach on July 29, 2017. Regarding the Mike Guy versus Junior Young bout, it was a competitive bout, and there were frequent instances where the referee had to intervene and instruct and warn not to hold, push, shove, hit, the head, or wrestle. Most of the admonishments were directed towards Mr. Guy as he was the fighter initiating most of the rule violations. At the end of one of the early rounds, Mr. Guy was inducted a point. Um, for flipping his opponent the canvas at the bell. In round seven and eight on three occasions, a junior owner was knocked to the ground. All three appeared to be the result of accidental tripping or being shoved or pushed while off balance. The referee did the best he could to keep the fight as clean as possible, but it was a brawler versus a boxer matchup uh, that often was uh, fought at close quarters uh, and said warnings of violation. I believe um, uh, 
that had Mr. Guy not flipped his opponent to the ground and had the point deducted, the decision would have been a majority draw. That's from the leading Can, we, uh, can I say one thing about that? Hang on a second. And then we have, um, I know Eddie's here, so um, we could invite him up also if you have something you'd like to add. Would you like to come up, Eddie? And, and, uh, give, you're, you're one of the judges on the, the scoring. Would you like to come up and, no? No. Well, um, I wasn't on the judges. No. Oh. Okay. It's not you. Sorry. Uh, we don't have anyone else here that was there then, right? Okay, sir. What were you going to say? Uh, one of the things that uh, that I'd like to. Have, uh, Sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. Yonan started off. He would come in and hit Mr. Guy, and hold, and he continued to hold and continued to hold, and and the referee. Mr. Hedgepitt, he, he warned him four or five times to quit holding. And Mike became frustrated and threw him down. And then it, it got tougher from there. But it still, does not, it still does not diminish the fact that Mike hit him with five punches in the corner and knocked him down, which would have made a difference totally in the fight. That's something that I think that's important. And, and one other thing, he all the warnings. Speak into the mic, please. He, he got three warnings for holding. Uh, one of the warnings, and one warning for pushing the head down, and he got one warning for the head. Like he got five warnings, three for holding, one for pushing my head down, and one for putting me in the headlock with no no points taken. You know, that's not what we're. Uh, disputing it was just the three knockdowns. So we're, we're okay. our main focus is, which I would have changed the fight to uh, a uh, win for me. Thank you, um, gentlemen. Do we need a motion to start discussion up here, or should we just open up the questions for the commissioners or the public? Or? No, you can open up discussion. Okay. okay. So, so commissioners, do you want to start on my right here, Commissioner Martin? Please. Andy. Maybe You're being asked uh, what your thoughts are. Um, if you're not comfortable saying it at this point, I, I don't know. You're being asked a question I mean, by Sure. Commissioner. Mary, you, you can answer, Mary, please. I mean, you can answer the question. Commissioner Senior Quidez, I, I mean, I've watched a lot of this, and 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 I, I deal with the boxers all the time, and I like Mr. Guy, and I like, I like everybody over there at that gym. I, it, it, it seems to me that 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 when you have knockdowns that are that are that are missed by referees, there needs to be a very clear, decisive knockdown. Okay, I've watched that film quite a few times. I wasn't there at this fight. I wasn't even there live watching it. I'm watching it on a film that was provided by Mr. Guy. The referee was in the best position to make that call. He was there hearing the punches, hearing the punches, d doing the things. And it's tough for me in an office in Sacramento or an office here in the Capitol to look at a film and tell you that that was a knockdown when it might have been, but it, it's more, it looks more to me like that Yonan was blocking the punches and, and he, no question I think he was somewhat disoriented, but he just kind of like lost his balance like a little bit and it was called a slip uh, by the referee and that's the referee's decision to make that call and if it's going to be flipped by this commission I think that's a I mean I think it has to be really really decisive I'll tell you why I asked I mean I usually have a, a I'm usually pretty opinionated about these things <laughs> And everybody knows that. Is that on the record? Yes. 
<laughs> I'm in shock. So <laughs> and I don't really have an opinion because this was such a messy fight. It was very messy on both parts. It's a not a clean fight. It was not a clean fight. And I have watched thousands and thousands and thousands of fights. And, you know, it, it wasn't a clean fight. It was very hard to tell. So were I to come in and second guess, it's going to be very, very tough. Very tough for me to do that. And I would want to second guess because that's kind of like a Monday morning you know, quarter, but Monday morning, and, and that's kind of what we do, and that's what we like to do, but I, I personally just don't feel comfortable doing that as much as I would want to. I just don't. Not with this. I would want, you know, I would want different angles, or want, and even then, I just don't think I would feel comfortable, because it's so messy, and it is a dirty fight. I'm sorry, it's an unclean, dirty, messy fight. It's very hard to tell. So that's kind of where I am. Okay. With the knockdowns, though, with the knockdowns. Hang on a second. Oh. Um, Commissioner? Sure. Um, just uh, going forward, I know we've just had a process for doing these kinds of changes of petitions, but we normally get links to the videos before the meeting. Mm -hmm. And um, so going forward, I want to make sure that we do that and if that's not explicit in our procedure. Because I just assumed there was no video because I got no, received no link via email, and that helps. You know, it's not necessary to review, but it really helps. Okay. Yeah, so right. going forward. Um, secondly, procedurally, um, and I know we're in the process of fixing this, that um, the, uh, each party, the um, petitioner for a change of decision and the respondent, they should get copies of uh, whatever opposing uh, information is out there. So Mr. Guy should have got this statement from the lead inspector. Um, finally, I'm, I'm concerned and a bit dismayed by the statement by the referee. Um, he does nothing in there to address the issue that we're trying uh, to address today, whether indeed they were knockdowns or a slip. Um, th there's um, a lot of discuss there's it's all discussion about how we didn't like the corner you know or or even the fighter and that's it, so it actually seems to me like perhaps his calls were tainted or maybe subconsciously retaliatory um, so I'm very disturbed by the referee statement and if um, I don't know whether he wasn't specifically directed to address the issue that's the subject of this petition um, and so he can't perhaps be, I don't know, it's, it's, it's disturbing to me. Um, and uh, looking at the scorecards, I just want to make, my understanding is that even if they're one of these knockdowns, is a knockdown that it would change the result. And I'm persuaded that, uh, in looking at the video, that the knockdown uh, in, I believe, the seventh round where he uh, crawled over and pulled himself up at the ropes. I believe that's a knockdown. Um, You're saying it was or was I it? believe it is, yeah, based on my experience. And I'm also, I'm also persuaded by the fact that a fighter uses the ropes to get up. I mean, we're all, every fighter's trained, if you're knocked down, to not act like you're hurt. So you only use the ropes if you're hurt. And, and yeah, and so. Um, so that's, that's my perspective. Um, and again, the fact of the statement of the referee that it almost like maybe was, he was tainted in his view of uh, Mr. Guy based on his corner, which yeah, I don't know, so. Dr. Williams? Yeah, the, the difficult thing for me was um, the video, it seemed like we saw the same two things over and over again. We yeah. saw uh, the takedown and then we saw the one of, of, of what you described of three knockdowns. Do we have <coughs> any of the other two or can we? I was trying to find the other one and there's that one it's, it's actually inside of the, the whole fight so I was trying to. What was like you have a video in, in your, we have the video in on your, 
I don't, I don't have that. Okay. Is it different? Yeah. What What round was the? Uh, the well, there was a there was a knockdown. There was a knockdown in the seventh, which is the big knockdown, the one where he hit him with five punches, unanswered punches. The, the one before. On seven. There was one before. In seven, seven and eight, two and eight, and one and seven. Okay. One and seven, and that and that one was where he was in the corner. And Mike delivered five punches unanswered. And this guy went against the ropes, and then he went, and he started slithering down, and he was trying to grab Mike, and he went right down and went to his knees. We have video of that? Yes, and it should have been on there. Now this was what I was provided. Yeah, Pardon me? This was what I was brought in. This was, this was. The one I have was. Which one you want to put on? Did you guys have it on the USB? I thought you have it on. Do you have it on? Yeah, we could see it. I would like them to see it, Mike, because I mean that's the whole thing right there, in a nutshell. You don't know. Go ahead and pull it and see if it see if it'll work on that. That's the only thing we can do. What are we trying to do here? There's a different part of that show. He wanted to see the knockdown. He wanted to Wait, see exactly. the one in the seventh. Well, of course, we would like to have better information or as, as accurate information as possible, but that's your responsibility to provide it to us. Okay, We can't sit here and wait for you guys to kind of figure this all out. It's, yes, that has yes, to be done prior to this meeting. I'm sorry. Uh, I it's okay. You don't have to apologize, but I mean, <coughs> so what, Mr. Guy, what are you trying to do? Well, it's, it, it's on. You have a flash drive. It has to be on the on the full fight. No, because on the flash, it's the same as what's on here. Do you think so? Yeah, it's on here. Okay. I'm sorry about that. That's, that's... I watched it on the big screen at home several times. Several times <coughs> I counted the punches. They were clean punches. He went against the ropes, and that, that if the ropes hold the fighter up, that's a knockdown in itself. Okay, hang on a second, sir. Dr. Okay. Williams, you were asking questions. Let's yeah, continue with you. My question was uh, whether we had any, we, we've heard that there were three of these episodes and, and I've seen, I think, one of the episodes that you're talking about as well as the takedown. So I was just wondering if there was video of the other two. Uh, if there is, I'd like to see it. If, if, if there isn't, then, then we just have to work with what we have. Dr. Williams, that, that one with the body punch, do you remember that one where he went to his knees? I think that's what they're that, counting. That's, that's, that's one of them. That's yeah, one of them. I, I, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the episodes they're talking about. I think it, something to give you a, a little different view of this whole thing is the other night there was a light heavyweight fight on TV. Hang on a second. Okay. Commissioner Souter, if you have some questions, well, you can still look while we're asking questions. Well. Uh, you know, I know we have to pay great attention to the profession, to the uh, professions code section 18640 and listening to the lamentations of the stakeholders. But this, I think, is the primary thing we do. And, it, I, and I know nothing about these gentlemen, uh, but I think they have an issue that probably has great importance to his career and his role as uh, a manager. And I, I do think if we're going to engage in, in, in a review of how our staff performed and how it altered or didn't alter a, a, a bout that was of great importance, I think we need to say, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it right. I mean, this, this, is, this is like watching my grandchildren on their parents' video. I don't get anything out of this. I think that what we should, we should really spend some time and think about how we support financially, operationally, these kind of appeals. I think we should be sitting here where it was edited, this is to be edited in some fashion where we could see it and see it in slow motion. One of our staff should be there representing hopefully the referee himself or someone representing the referees, what their decision was, and these two should be able to sit there and say no, yes, whatever. Um, 
I'm personally highly sympathetic in this to Mr. Guy. But I'm where she is, this is such ineffectual material on which to base a decision that theoretically has great importance to him. And we're the only people who can bring him some vision of justice in this matter, and we don't have the we don't have the material to do it. And yet I think it's one of the most important things we do. Can so I'm sitting here where she is. I think he's right, but I don't know. Can they come back? Hang on, I'll get there. <laughs> As usual, the sage of our commissioner, 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 commissioner Souter has expressed it, I think, uh, effectively. Um, so I, here's what I think. I think that uh, we're going to invite you back to give you another chance. I think um, you need to do a better job once again, and we've talked about this, of helping them organize their presentation with our checklist, with somebody that was there at the fight attending here, so we can have we can ask good questions and, and give a good result. So, are you gentlemen willing to come back at the next commission meeting? Yeah. Okay, um, commissioners. I don't know if we need to vote on that. Gary, do we need to make a? No, it's simply a directive. Okay. Uh, commissioners, are you okay with that? Yeah, I think okay. somebody on our staff with impartiality should oversee the creation of a video which will allow us to make a valid decision. Okay. That's what we're going to do. You're invited to come back. You can work it out with Mr. Foster at the next commission meeting, which will be in February if you like. Um, work with the staff to put your presentation together in a, in a form that I'm sure you well know gives exactly what you're gives us exactly what you want us to see. Okay. okay? Is that fair enough? Yeah. Okay, Mr. Guy. Is that going to harm you in the meantime because this is on on your record as a loss? I mean, I don't know if you can put like a footnote in Fight Facts that it's under review by the commission, or is that well, that will just be sufficient to let people in the community know? I think it affects it. Uh, it does affect it. Affects it. Right I, think I think it affects those. You know, it affects. I, I, think, I, I think he should be able to say, and, and I'm glad you raised that, it's under review by the commission and there will be a decision in February. You can do that, right? Now. Yeah, I can yeah. do that today. Yeah. Can say that. We can add it on five facts. Okay. Okay? Appreciate what you said, but I work for nothing. <laughs> Not as manager. Oh, just, I'm, I'm one, one of his trainers. Yeah. And that's all I am. Sir. Okay. Gentlemen, we'll see you again in February. All right, thank you. Do your homework. All right. If you're not getting the, the, the uh, cooperation out of stuff, which I know you will, you can contact us directly. Andy's been great. Okay. We can't, we can't complain about it. Thank we, you. We appreciate it. It's the opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you. Agenda item number seven. Actually, I'm going to change the, I'm going to move the agenda around a little bit. I want to do some action items here. Let's move to agenda item number nine. Discussion, review, and possible action regarding the delegation of amateur kickboxing to the International Kickboxing Federation, known as ICAF. I know Mr. Fossum is here. Mr. Foster? Mr. Chairman, this is, this is Steve Fossum's IKF uh, up again for renewal. Um, they, uh, the commission, the uh, IKF has now sanctioned 180 events on behalf of the commission in amateur kickboxing since receiving the delegation and they have two more scheduled for this weekend okay um, I would I, my recommendation to this commission is at this point in time is to give Mr. Fossum um, the ongoing delegation uh, that CAMO and the United States Fight League um, and USA Boxing have where uh, it can be revoked at any time, but where he just has to do his annual report, and this doesn't have to be an agenda item in that next December. But that's my recommendation. Okay, Mr. We, um, we have, can we have then a motion to, what are we gonna do? Uh, Reapprove, re extend, or approve a new delegation to IKF, what's the action? To, to delegate, uh, um, to delegate. Give me, the, give me the words, please, the, for a motion. It could be just simply to renew the delegation. Okay. So I would like a motion to renew the delegation to IKF, please. I so move. We have a motion from Vice Chair. Second? Second. 
Second, Dr. Williams. Uh, we can now do discussion. So, Mr. Fossum, before you say anything, I want to open it up to our commissioners here for any direct questions, unless you have something else to add. Mr. Foster, okay. Commissioner Sauer, can we start with you? Do you have any questions for Mr. Foster? No, sir. No, sir. Dr. Williams? No. None? Vice Chair? Um, I want to say thank you, Steve, for doing a great job. This is a great service um, to the state of California in regulating the kickboxing, and I know um, other states are, you're being helpful in other jurisdictions as well, and they're looking to California as they should um, uh, to lead in this regard. And I also want to thank you personally for your, um, your efforts to make the reports um, exactly as, as we like, because I know you do great work, but then documenting to us is sometimes two different things, and that's, uh, uh, you've succeeded, I think, on both levels, so thank you for that. What she said. What she said. <laughs> I will, th at this time then, invite anyone from the public to comment on this uh, matter. Not seeing anyone. Mr. Fossum, do you want to add anything? Uh, we have our other report coming up later. I'll give it all then, I guess. <laughs> That'll be great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Fossum, would you please call the roll for the vote? Chairman Corbelli? Aye. Vice Chairman Lehman? Aye. Commissioner Shinyar Kidez? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner and Dr. Williams. Aye. 5-0, sir. Congratulations. Keep up the good work. Keep attending. Keep us informed. And it'll, it'll go well. Thank you, sir. I, I'm going to move to agenda item number 12. Review and approval of petition to change decision form. Mr. Foster. Um, Mr. Chairman, at, at the last meeting, uh, the commission um, approved a process for uh, for uh, uh, the commission, uh, the, the combatants and, and, and the stakeholders to um, engage in the change of decision process. Um, but we left it open with the, we'll have a form at the next meeting. Um, I've worked, uh, uh, I and Sophia and Heather have worked with Vice Chair Lehman to create a form. Um, and the form is uh, is in your packet, and this is simply an addition to the procedure that was approved at the last meeting. So we are we, we are going to approve this form, correct? Unless there's amendments. Yes. Yeah. There's just some. There's just a few typos. Commissioner uh, Vice Chair Lehman, would you like to tell us what we're up to? Um, so, kind of as we saw today, you know, it's very important that um, both for efficiency for our office and uh, <coughs> fairness and due process to our stakeholders and, um, you know, our, our referees and, and everybody that works on these important fights, uh, that we have a, a fair and, and process that's knowledge that's available that people know how to use and access for change of decision. And so at last meeting, uh, we adopted uh, a process that how to uh, do a change of decision and the information and, and what information needs to be provided and given to the other parties. And that was approved last uh, meeting. And that's now available on our, um, on our webpage. I checked it out. And do we have it in Spanish now? We, I know we were going to. It's being translated. Correct. Okay. And so as part of that, um, we drafted this form. So like, for example, today we had a petition for a change of decision. We would have had this form filled out, which would help us. What re rules were violated and how did it change the decision? And also we have that uh, about if we need an interpreter and that's provided at no charge uh, telephonically through DCA services. Um, again, though, this form is optional because it's not in, this, in the actual rule, so we can't force people to use this form, but usually people do use forms. This form would certainly help to marshal the relevant information necessary for the Commission to make a decision. Uh, you are correct, though, in the past, the Commission has always basically is just relied upon a letter. And, of course, we cannot compel this form, you know, unless we have a regulation. Uh, but this would uh, certainly, I would imagine, to assist all of the, uh, the people who are the petitioners who wanted to, you know, ask for a petition and change, and would assist the commission in making an informed decision. 
Uh, I think that we can, or maybe the chair can direct staff to fill out this form as part of our packets and process and, and whenever we're going to be hearing an appeal. I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, I think it, it's actually better for the petitioner to actually uh, present the form uh, because that would just <coughs> raise other issues as to whether or not the staff had ad adequately had, uh, you know, put in relevant information. Particularly when you're getting to how, when you get to the, uh, the second page, if you see how did the violation of those laws, rules, or regulations affect the result of your bout, uh, that's subject to interpretation and. Uh, I think it's up to the petitioner to provide that information to the commission. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they just submit a letter, we would uh, respond, here's this form, you know, we recommend that you fill it out, for example. But I agree with what you're saying, we want this form. So if they just petition for change of decision by an email to Mr. Foster, that will qualify as a timely request, but then we will send this form to them requesting that they fill it out for our hearing. So let me amend my question to you then. If they then do not, for whatever reason, fill out the form and they just go with the letter, can we direct staff to do their best to follow this as a guideline and fill it out on behalf of staff for the commission? And it will help, hope, and, and my thought is it will help avoid what we saw here earlier is a lot of, what did we call it, Commissioner Souter? A kids uh, presentation? A kids program? Something like that. I don't see a problem with that, provided it's uh, noted on the record that it, it was the staff providing a summary of the information and provided in the format uh, acceptable to the commission. Uh, but, 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 but quite frankly, you can only rely upon that letter right. from the petitioner as to you know, their basis. Yeah, our, our staff cannot be advocates for the petitioner. Exactly. That's the conflict of interest. So we can't really direct. Okay. our staff to be an advocate for someone petitioning to change a decision. Okay. But I think people will use the form. Yes. Okay. Um, I need a motion to approve this petition, please. I'm so moved. We have a motion to approve. Do I have a second? Second. We have a second. Do you have comments? Yeah, I, I just wonder whether we should put like a checklist, not like whether we should have a checklist on this as well and ask whether there's any video, whether the bout was televised, whether there's any video, are they requesting a hearing? Because maybe they don't want a hearing. If they want a hearing, whether they will be presenting live witnesses and or written witness statements, you know, just a checklist so that they can go about checking it off and telling and advising us what to be expecting and then giving them a, an actual date so that we can give them a date by which they must provide those things and then we can give them a hearing date or a commission hearing date. I think that's on our procedure that we adopted last meeting. This is just requesting to implement the procedure. And so once the procedure's implemented, then we send notices saying you have, you know, please send us videos, you have X amount of days to send it to us and we will return it. It sort of gives us a heads up once mm -hmm. they're requesting, mm -hmm. you know, and it also gives them a checklist mm -hmm. so they are thinking about what they're going to mm -hmm. do. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I agree on the, vi the videos. So videos and witnesses. We do say attach additional information, but maybe that's too vague. Right. So revise it to include maybe at the bottom. Is there a video of mm -hmm. the bout? Right. And please send links, edited if possible. <laughs> okay. Prior to any hearing or meeting of the commission. But, but well, th no. this is just to this is just for Andy to decide whether we need a hearing. Right. Oh, Are there? Yeah. Is there video? Were there witnesses? Or do you have witnesses? You know, things just because really what you're doing <coughs> is getting them to prepare. You know, not just a request for a hearing, but you're really just getting them to start thinking about what this is, you know, what they're going to be doing. 
what information that the commission needs to have. Mm -hmm. And what they need to have. Right, but also, mm -hmm. correct. But it's everybody, right? So correct. they need to prepare, we need to prepare, because, because it's not just you need to do this. If we're going to have a complete hearing, part of the onus is on us too, right? We can't just have rely on them because then what we have is a hearing that we're not happy with. But again, just to be clear, this does not, this is just goes to Andy and he decides whether we're gonna have a hearing. Probably about, he, um, probably 50% or tw only 20% of requests for change of decision get to us for a hearing. Mm -hmm. So this is just for Andy. And then if Andy determines, you know, it could, it's more likely, it's a substantial likelihood, I think, was the standard but that a change of, then that triggers that procedure where um, we tell people right. videos and, and things see, like it's that. It's really easy when it's an HBO fight or a Showtime fight or whatever. <coughs> Some of our fights are not televised or not whatever, but there is video and they have witnesses and mm -hmm. we may not know about it because it's a small fight or it's a club fight or it's a whatever fight, right? So they will give you a heads up of who it is we can, if you decide that it's something that you want to look at. You know what I mean? Instead of you having to scramble and look for it yourself. Okay. Yeah, just... I mean, the more information you get, the okay. easier it is to just, I'm just saying, it's just easier. I do think the petitioners should be the providing the information. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you know what I mean? Like, right, that's not your responsibility. Yeah. The more you get, the easier it is. And, and, and then, yeah, I think it's on them. Here, here's a little nuance that was a problem today, in my mm -hmm. opinion, see if you all agree. While we leave it to them, um, and you guys did the best you could, thank you, it just, it was just not, it, it made things muddier and grayer and and caused us to have to re revisit this. So causing more work and more time for you all. Mm -hmm. So if you're tightening up the process on the front end, even if they're the ones responsible for providing information, you know it's a clean presentation by the time it gets here, you'll get a good decision. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this just makes it, I mean, the more they can give you up front, the more information you have up front, the easier your job is gonna be. Right. Okay, so I so to, to go back to the table, include the checklist on this form of video. Was it televised? Were there witnesses? Were the officials involved? And you have statements from them. Yeah, I, I yeah, that sounds good. So where are we? Well, we'll add that as a change of the motion after we finish our comments. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we can approve this really form with amendments. Yeah, right. Sure we can. We can approve it with the Let's changes. Yeah, yeah, but sorry, what was that? We can approve it with the changes, right? We can approve I'd it. I'd still like to bring the form back. Oh. Well, at the next. Why don't we let me work on this? So let's get your changes. Let's change your motion to include these changes and give you, you two the ability to make to add those things and we'll get the petition done. Let's 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 try to do that. Do you have other things you want to add? No. Okay. Do you have other comments you want to make now? We can, you can, yeah. come, we can come back to you. Dr. Williams? No. Okay. Commissioner Souter? No. Okay. So I'm going to ask for a mo to amend the, your, the motion that you made to include the things that you and Mary just worked out. Okay. So we have that. Can I have another second, Dr. Williams? I think so. Okay. We'll work on it so now we have an amended motion. We'll work on it next week. Now we can invite anyone from the public to come up and, and comment if they wish on this matter. Not seeing anyone. Um, Andy, please call the vote. Chairman Corvelli? Aye. Vice Chair Lehman? Aye. Commissioner Senior Quidez? Aye. Commissioner Souter? Aye. Commissioner and Dr. Williams? Aye. Good. We have a petition. Thank you for the work you did, Vice Chair Lehman. That's a lot of effort. And I hope it will be a great process by the time you're done. <laughs> okay. Does anyone need a uh, five minute break? No? Nope. Let's keep rolling then. Um, agenda item number seven. Subcommittee updates. We have Pension Fund Subcommittee, uh, Commissioners Lehman and Ayala. Um, um, I is a report from Beth Harrington, for benefit resources regarding the Pension Fund Administration. Hello, Beth, how are you? Welcome, good to see you. Thank you. I'm 
Beth Harrington, Benefit Resources. I have been contracted by the Commission to administer the retirement plan. It's a pleasure to be here today. In the packets that you received, I have about four pages to go through. The net plan assets as of the end of December, we administer this plan on a calendar year, so the last valuation formal valuation that we did was as of December 31st, 2016. At that time, the net assets were 5,138,396. The last statement I have on the Raymond James account was at October 31st, and I know Cyril's here right next to me. He probably has a better update for me, but I had about $5 million in the Beth, account. Beth and Cyril, would you like to make this report together? Or you want to take turns? Or? Um, Cyril Shaw with Raymond James, and I think it would be helpful if um, Ms. Harrington finishes her presentation because it helps informs some of what I'm going to present on. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Cyril. During 2017, $400,000 was transferred out of the Raymond James account to the operating account we call the Smith account, which is the basically the check writing account, and that was used to pay benefits, et cetera. Who writes those checks for us? The department. The department, the DCA accounting department. <coughs> On the income statement, which is the second page of the attachment, or <laughs> one of the pages of the attachment, has the details about the activity of the account in 2016. In the gray box, <coughs> outlines the status of the boxers and the account balances as of the end of 2016. In summary, we have three types of covered boxers covered, fully vested, or coded as a C. Coded boxers, or excuse me, covered boxers who have now a break in service, so a lot of times they fought, 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 then they left for a while, they were covered, and then they came back for a short period of time, or have not boxed in a long time. And then there's covered boxers who continue to, to fight, and those are pending boxers. Those three categories represent 315 boxers for the majority of the account balance, 3,731,794. There were 46 boxers newly eligible or eligible for benefits this year. So what that comprises of is boxers who are in this covered category who are either age 50, 51, or 52 because by the time they're 53, they're considered a late claimant. So we had 46 boxers listed on the status of eligible for benefits this year. 14 of them had been paid through November 10th when this agenda was prepared. Since then, two additional boxers have been paid. So the total is now 227734 for 2017. I must comment that um, Sylvia Cornejo has been doing a great job. She finds boxers all the time. Beth, does this guy have any benefits? And so we look that up. So thank you, Sylvia, for all your hard work. And Where'd she go? I don't know. She went to get lunch, oh, sir. Okay. Also, I'm thanking her in, in absentia, but that's worthy of that. There were 26 potential late claimants who went beyond the three-year benefit window, so they had attained age 53 or older, so their benefits were allocated to the remaining active boxers in 2016. That represented about 380,780. Does that mean that they were denied? It means they did not come forward for benefits. We haven't denied anybody benefits. Um, one comment I will make on distributions, we have had the occasion where two of the beneficiaries of the pension plan had no U.S. Social Security numbers and they were living overseas. Um, we paid benefits to them anyway, but no taxes were withheld on those benefits because we have no Social Security number to which to withhold those benefits. Um, so that's just kind of an open issue. Um, in the for-profit world, most of my clients, um, I can't pay benefits to somebody who doesn't have a social security number, but I'm taking direction of the DRC and that was their decision, so. Taking direction of who? DRC. DCA. DCA, sorry. <laughs> I don't know where DRC came from, sorry. <laughs> is, there another, is there another acronym I've forgotten? <laughs> 
sorry, Andy. So just I'm sorry, Commissioner Lightman. The DCA told yes. you specifically yes. that you can. They they said benefits. they were going to pay the benefits to those uh, participants who were covered under the program, even if they had no social security number. Okay, you have to report that. Um, I have it in an email, yes. Okay, send it to Mr. Austin. <laughs> that was the right you don't want to I think it's good that we're paying for benefits, though. Isn't that the <laughs> yes, good point? Yeah. yeah. It's a rock and a hard place kind of a position okay. to be in. So Let's pay the benefits. Yes, we paid the benefits, so you know. We, and, and I don't want this to, for anyone to think that you, on, on item three there, B3, that you were denying, we denied any benefits because we did not. No. Right. And then do you, do you, you get like the, Cancel checks later or something so that we actually see that they're getting paid. And so those all get processed through DCA in this Smith account, and I don't actually see the canceled checks, but I do see the activity through the bank account and um, reflect that in these income statements and balance sheets that we prepare for you annually. But we just see the money getting taken out. Yes. We don't actually see the benefits getting paid. No. Um. So I would assume that the checks get cashed, but I have no valid verification or validation of that. Well, but we we get the we get the checks um, in the in the office. Oh, well, we get them in the office, and then you know we we're in communication with these boxers most always because they're pretty excited about getting their money. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we mail it to them and up until up until uh, the fiscal system came you could see if you go back and you look at your old CalSTARS reports you can see a report there. I, just, I was thinking about these two and one you know just floating around somewhere and uh, just want to make sure they actually got them. The other thing I was thinking about I would like to really know how many <coughs> Otherwise, there's this, there's this weird, I guess, requirement that they needed to sign up for, for the pension plan at the time that they were fighting. And although, obviously, at that time, this plan was not administered particularly well because they weren't collecting even some of the required information. And the other, and, and if you didn't sign up, if you didn't like sign up, and what they still were taking money for these fights and for these fighters. So um, even though they may qualify for the pension plan, other than the fact that they would have that they didn't sign up, I would like to know how many of those fighters exist today that technically we don't think qualify for this pension plan other than for the fact that they didn't sign up for the plan. You know what I mean? So that's a procedural issue, and I do the accounting, so I don't really know the answer to your question. Um, but as far as becoming a covered boxer, it's a pretty stringent rule. You have to fight, I think it's 75 rounds, um, and you have to have at least 10 rounds in four years. And they don't have to be consecutive. So these are not just sometime fighters. Those, let's say they qualify under all of this, yes. but at the time they were fighting, they didn't actually sign up. Sign up. Well, I have an awful lot of boxers on our list, and I pay. We pay benefits or pr uh, provide instructions for paying benefits to anybody who says that they are due a benefit. I don't know of any. I don't know of any who failed to sign up who didn't get paid benefits. I don't know how to answer that question. I don't know the answer either. But as you and I have talked about this issue, um, if those people come forward, whether they're signed up or not, I go and verify and look through the stuff to see. Like, I am been sitting in box right counting rounds one day <laughs> doing this for this guy. If they qualify under the rules, one poor guy, he was like two rounds short or something. And I mean, that's, it's just the rule. Take them out back and give them a couple of rounds. <laughs> 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 what about signing up for? I mean, that just seems kind of ludicrous to me. If they qualify under the rounds and the years and everything else, then we'll get them paid. Okay. It'll it'll be a formula, but we'll get them paid. Yeah. Okay. That has been my experience too, because they do show up on the rounds and purse report. So sometimes I'll go back and ask for a date of birth or something to verify that it 
because sometimes the names get confusing as well. But we spend a lot of time scrubbing that data, and it's been very clean the last couple of years, I think. And um, just Heather just brought this to my attention, and maybe the commissioners don't. That's the way it was in the past. We include everybody now. Okay, so everybody that's fighting is, is being put forward at the end of the year. And, and one thing uh, Beth and I went back and forth on a little bit, and, and I sent her a clarifying memo, is, is fights that happen in California, it's regulated by CSAC, even if it's on native land, those count. Okay, and we went back and forth on that a little bit. Um, but if we regulate it, it's in California, even if it's on tribal, it counts. And that, you know. There's nothing we can do for the two round person. <laughs> No, sir. It might have been three rounds. It might have been one round. It was really close to the seventh. I think it was two rounds. So, I'm sorry. I wasn't, cl I wasn't, I wasn't clear about um, this sign-up rule from the past. Are we enforcing that? No, ma'am. Okay. I don't think it was exactly a rule. It was just like your name got on the list if you signed up. But now we're... We're correcting it. I mean, it's anybody that comes forward, it's got the stuff, they get paid. Okay. Is there a regulatory change that needs to be made? No, ma'am. Because no. of that? Okay. okay. It, it was certainly for, just for the convenience of tracking. Okay. Uh, folks, the, but, but no, they're not required to actually sign up, you know, so to speak. But it does make it more convenient for staff to keep track of the people. Okay. Um, can I just ask a question um, on the contribution history charts? Thank you for these charts. They're very helpful. Um, our contributions have gone up 2015 and 2016. And why weren't they so high in 2013 and 14? Was that because we just didn't have as many fights, Mr. Foster? Do you see? Um, I'm like on page. Um, I'm on this page of best report, Andy. Yes, ma'am. The, yeah. the, the, the fifth chart, I mean, the fourth chart at the bottom. Um, Were we just not let, doing things procedurally? Let, let me be very direct about that. Um, this says something, something I give a little credit uh, here to Chairman Carvelli on this, about uh, going out and meeting this, with some of these people with, with me and stuff, and, and Commissioner Martha uh, with, with K2, okay? Uh, this has to do with TV events, okay? And this, not only does it track with our revenue, but because our revenue is derived from events, so is our pension fund. So there you go. So the more TV events you have, the more your pension goes up, and the more our general revenue streams go up. That's a win-win. Okay, got it. Benefits. Thanks. Commissioner <laughs> Sauer? Nope. Well, thank you. Thank you, Matthew. And now we have Cyril Shaw of Raymond James Financial Services and for an update on our, our investment portfolio. Thank you, uh, Chair Carvelli, Vice Chair Lehman, and uh, Commissioners. It's a great opportunity to be here. Um, have enjoyed um, our, our working history between Raymond James and the Commission. Um, and very proud of the uh, small role that we play in protecting the health and safety of uh, professional fighters in the state of California. So um, I'm happy to um, do a brief presentation and of course answer any questions um, about the asset allocation um, and the performance of the fund. Um, but um, primarily would like to um, uh, to discuss something that we all touched on together um, in this room about a year ago, which is more of a long-term outlook. Where do we see this fund um, from uh, a balance standpoint, um, from a budgeting standpoint, um, you know, one, three, five years from now? And in my business, it's a little bit difficult to do, but I do have a handout that I think would be helpful if we can. Thank you. It's okay. We have a rule that we're not supposed to give handouts at the meeting. They need to be given to Mr. Foster two weeks before. So, going forward. Okay. We'll do. <laughs> You're getting cool. a huge pass. I'll put this into the into the record. You guys right. need some as well. Uh, you guys need some idea? I do. So. Yeah, because no one in the digest. Yeah, no, it's, fortunately it's just one page, it's mostly disclaimers, it's just one page, but I will, it is, um, there's a lot of information in this, in this uh, um, one page that I've handed out, it's page two with the, uh, 
the chart on it, is that just to explain what this chart represents, um, and this is going back um, about seven years to uh, um, the, uh, the beginning of 2010, is that the, the green line is the investment performance of the fund, and the blue line are the, um, the withdrawals from, and I shouldn't say the fund, I should say the account, because there is a distinction. Um, so looking at that, looking at the top line um, of numbers below the bold line, you'll see that our beginning market value is 5149036. Just next to that, this year, uh, we've had withdrawals of 400,000. Are you with me? Okay. And then uh, the income and change in market value, which gave us an ending market value, and this is um, as of yesterday, so here's an updated number, 5095350, rounding up. So our investment returns for the year, uh, year to date, 346,000, or about 7%. So, well, like I said, it's, it's difficult to, to project exactly where this fund will be in five years. I can really distill it down to two, two variables. One is the, the withdrawals, which you can see in that second column do fluctuate. We've had as high as 500,000 in withdrawals in, um, in, in one year. Um, which is, which is a good sign, it means that we're finding boxers and, and, and they're getting paid. Um, and the second variable is the um, investment performance, which you can see in the second to last column, um, that does fluctuate as well, as high as, over the last several years, as high as 9%, um, the lowest being the one down here that we had where we were down about 1%. Um, so looking backward, I'm proud to say that we have, over the last several years, um, withdrawn 1.95, almost $2 million um, dollars out of the fund, um, almost exclusively for uh, 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 professional fighter benefits. And we've been able to uh, maintain um, and, um, in fact, increase the value of the fund. So to answer the, the million dollar question, in, an, in, in a nutshell, uh, $5 million, thank you. <laughs> More accurately, a $5 million question. Um, in a nutshell, in as, as specific as I can be, um, it would be that historically, based on what I'm seeing here historically and what we anticipate going forward, if our uh, withdrawals <coughs> stay within this roughly $200,000 to $400,000 range per year, um, and we have similar to performance to what we've seen over the last several years, I would anticipate that we can maintain these types of withdrawals um, and still maintain that $5 million level of the fund looking out, looking out five years. Why was 09, 010 so strong? Was that just the market? The, yeah, so this was just 2010, um, and the, um, it was part of it was residual recovery from the financial crisis, yes. Um, and then 2015, um, that was that one, the one down year, that was um, things that have very little to do with uh, California and the U.S. economy, but um, things that were happening, happening globally in, in Asia, in Europe. Um, that was also, I think it was December of that year that oil prices got down to $27 a barrel. So we've been through all of that as a fund and still at this level. So let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So um, we are in a record-breaking market. And so um, I, I'll put it this way, and you'll have to respond. Why is our return only 5.5%? I mean, I'm seeing 10, 11, 12% returns out there. So, full, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and so for year to date, our performance for that period is 6.94%. And relative to what the S&P 500 has done, um, yes, that's significantly um, lower than, than what the stock market has returned. Our allocation by design is, and I'll, I'm happy to get into the reasons why, um, is, is quite conservative. Um, we have about 30% exposure to equities. So, and we have absolutely participated in the growth of the market with that 30%. And that's where a lot of that change in market value comes from, that 232,000. Um, the remaining 70% uh, more conservative fixed income investments are income oriented, may have some price appreciation or fluctuation, um, but are primarily paying us um, a 2 to 3% yield in this low interest rate environment. 
the reason why we have such a conservative allocation, why we implemented a conservative allocation several years ago, and why we still do, even in a year like this, when, when returns on the market have, have, been, have been high, is because of some of the information that, that Beth reviewed, and that is the number of participants that we have and the potential for, in any given year, an 8%, a 10% drawdown in assets. So to reduce the amount of volatility that we have in the account, um, the last thing we'd want to, we would want to see is um, this account, the value of this account drop by double digits and then have a drawdown of another potential double digits and not have the opportunity for the fund to recover. And so, and it's also the uncertainty of when these uh, beneficiaries of the fund may or may not come forward. And so it's, I feel it's, it's our duty to the participants to lessen the volatility of the fund so that if and when they do come forward, the assets are there and available for them. And we don't put ourselves in a position where the assets are, are you know, extremely high one year, extremely low the next year, um, depending on, on you know, what the market does. Did you make any changes in 2017? To we made that? some tactical changes in the, uh, just in November. Um, and those two, I don't think those are highly... I think, Earlier this year, sir? Uh, what's that? Earlier this year, during the, have you made? Yes, yes. So the most recent changes, and these were the really the only significant besides rebalancing, the only significant tactical changes that we made um, in November, and they were twofold. One is that we reduced our exposure to high yield bonds, um, which are below investment grade, and that's because um, uh, interest rates have come down on those bonds, and the risk associated with them doesn't. We're not necessarily compensated for the the um, the additional. Um, interest rate return that we would get on those when interest rates were higher. The second is that we shifted on the stock side, we shifted some money um, out of U.S. small cap and added to international investments. Um, and, and that's not because we, um, it's, it's because we are still bullish on U.S. equities, but feel that there's relative value in developed international. Um, and so that was the reason for that shift. So those are two tactical shifts. November, but yes. any other time this year that you made similar allocation changes? Significant tactical changes, no rebalancing. Uh, yes, oh, and no, I, actually wait, I take that back. Um, there was also a change that we made, um, not from an allocation standpoint, um, but this is a little bit more, a little more technical, is just the underlying funds that we used. We used funds that were, um, quite frankly, um, less expensive. Uh, and more cost effective um, to the uh, to the account and to the fund. Yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm trying to express a little slight frustration in the fact that we are not gaining along with kind of commensurate with the market or even close. Mm -hmm. We're just maintaining. I mean, I understand the conservative to maintain the corpus, but uh, yeah. Yeah, can you? I mean, if you see the market climbing like that, isn't there some thought to? shifting your allocations at least for short term and then shifting it back to something <coughs> yes yeah yes it's a good question and um there we do have the ability to do that um and we could do that on a longer term basis um which is what i would recommend i don't think you would want um and it would be difficult per an investment policy statement to have us um markedly shifting the allocation from you know very aggressive and growth oriented to very conservative, but we could definitely um, at the margins go from something that's less conservative to something that is that, that is. How do we affect that? I mean, you know, we don't all think about our pension fund every day, I'm sure. Maybe Mary does, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you now what I would like to be, I think we would like to be asked, like, hey, do you, the market is obviously doing what it's doing. Mm -hmm. There's an opportunity here to maybe take a little more risk. What do you, what do you all think? I mean, what is, is there a procedure for this, gentlemen? And who's making these decisions? We're not being asked, obviously. Sir, I think this, I mean, you're in a quorum right now. I'm sure you could direct Mr. Well, Shaw I'm to do it. We're prepared to make asset allocation decisions at this minute, but it may be a little late this year. But, uh, well, so if, if I may, Chair Carvelli, um, there is an opportunity because we're at um, the five-year mark and um, updating the investment policy statement. And so there is an opportunity there where we can, um, instead of being confined to a pretty rigid allocation, uh, 
give ourselves more as a fund, give our, in, in, um, or as our, our policy statement, give it more flexibility, that would allow myself and Raymond James to make more investment-based tactical decisions um, throughout the year that I believe you're looking for um, that may, um, in the end, be more effective and, and allow us to participate better in the returns um, if we're seeing opportunities. This, this fund and this allocation relative to other accounts is, is quite rigid. And I think that may be by design per contract, yeah. um, but there may be an opportunity to add more flexibility. And, and I know I personally, and I think that my colleagues at Raymond James would agree that we would love to have a little bit more flexibility so that we can add have more value. Have you expressed value. that prior to this meeting today? What's that? Have you expressed that thought prior to this meeting? Well, um, not quite because um, it's my understanding that we're constrained by the contract, which includes the investment policy statement and the, the confines of the asset ranges with, well, within it. What does it. that flexibility mean, though? Do you need to... Can you just make the changes without actually coming before the commission and asking? That's there, the question. There would yes. That to answer the short answer is yes. There would be um, you know a moderate amount of discretion within the ranges identified in the policy statement. So we could become more growth oriented for a period. It would any shift that we make would be thoughtful and um, and, and and metered. So it would be you know, maybe 5% here or 10% there, but it would be a shift and it could absolutely um, affect the, uh, you know, the returns in the, at the, over the course of any period. Congress is about to pass a tax, well, whatever you want to call it, tax something package. What do you think is going to happen? How will that affect the market? So if, um, it's a good question, another five, maybe $5 trillion question. Um, the, uh, <laughs> what the heck, you're here. <laughs> so um, I'll, I'll, one aspect of it is, um, and maybe the primary highlight, um, if it passes somewhat in the forms that have been presented, uh, that have been passed thus far, is um, a cut in the corporate tax rate. Um, if that happens, different corporations, different sectors will be affected to varying degrees, but um, for those corporations that benefit from that tax cut, that, those are um, earnings that will drop directly to the bottom line. So that can uh, help S&P 500 earnings, and that absolutely can help um, affect the, uh, the market going forward. So there's that's, but another thing that we always consider, that being said, is that there's also the anticipation of the passage and then the actual implementation and what that means, as well as a lot of the other external factors. But I would say that like one- Like the war with North Korea. Right, and, 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 and even other things were less, you know, more innocuous in, in the US that, you know, economic issues that, right. that you may, we may or may not foresee. But I would say, yes, that, at least that one aspect of the tax bill absolutely could um, help corporate earnings, which helps stock prices. So it's not a reasonable to think the market could get to 3,000, you know, keep going, keep going for a while. No, yes, well, not reasonable. Not reasonable? Yeah. It's, well, it's, I, um, you know, without speculating too much, I would say that this is all against the backdrop of um, a, a stock market that hasn't corrected more than 3% over the last 12 months, which is historically unheard of. Does that mean that we're due? That's tough to say, but would it be unusual that we get more than a 3% correction um, in the near term or the intermediate term? I would say that would be somewhat likely. So it's a balance of those two things. If we're optimistic about um, growth in the economy and growth in, in the stock market and equities, then we should be positioned in such a, in, to take advantage of that. But we also want to be sure that we're conservative enough that we could ride out a 5 7%, 10% correction in the market, um, particularly if, if we're going to be allowing withdrawal, you know, if we're going to have withdrawals from the account during that same period. Do you have a recommendation for us on that? Would you like to have that flexibility? Um, I would. I would. And I would um, appreciate if I, I can take this uh, as direction, if that's okay, um, as to when I speak to DCA contracts about the investment policy statement, um, if there is a way to have some sort of flexibility in that investment policy statement, which you would then approve. Um, finally, before it's implemented, um, I would, I think it would be very helpful to have that type of discretion. 
Well, that's not till the end of February, so that's another 90 plus days. I don't know. I don't know. Commissioners, what are your thoughts here? Is, is there anything in the reg about the pension plan that defines the nature of the investments? No, not, not no. that I'm aware of. No. There isn't. And actually, I've been asking about this allocation since like last year because, because I've been very frustrated by it. It hasn't moved actually really at all as compared to something that would be in the private industry pension plan. It's just been like, you know, an elephant watching the market swinging or whatever. And um, Commissioner Van has said, why don't we have him make a, you know, a graph for us? And here it is. And it's clear as day there needs to be some mechanism for us to take advantage of the market now that it, there's positive gains to be made. So, um, and yeah, there's always risk, but if you don't, you know, and, and we can minimize some of that risk, um, but we have to make sure that we're not doing anything, you know, contrary to what we're allowed to do. Yeah, we have to review the contract, mm -hmm. obviously. We can review the contract, but the ultimate discretion of the way that money's managed is not with me, it's not with Gary, it's not with the contracts, it's with this commission in a quorum. That's my understanding. I would like to see what other pension plans do, you know, as far as their allocation of, you know, equity and. How does, how does well, I, I wonder if it would not be feasible to, uh, uh, and incidentally, I'm all in favor of caution. Mm -hmm. I mean, asking a commission like this to take over some significant role in determining allocations. If I was a retired fighter, I would say I'm going to get my money as quickly as possible. <laughs> but there's some very successful business people in this commission area. <laughs> it, 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 it would be interesting to see, and I'm sure you have access <coughs> to uh, uh, various uh, funds like ours, uh, and who have different kinds of investment philosophies. And I think this is an important issue, but I'd like to know what other people are doing. We have access to, to funds where people investing their own money or, or for families or for whatever. But it would be interesting for you to tell us, here are different philosophical attitudes about investing the kind of money that's similar to what you have with your kind of drawdowns. And here has been their performance over the last five or seven years. Uh, and I think, you know, this might be a, a time just to have at some point, because it is a lot of money, and it's for a very important cause. Maybe we could just, you know, adjacent the night before or whatever, one of our meetings, sit down and have a session with them mm -hmm. and find out what their experiences have been, and then we can play our own attitudes into into it. This is a very big deal, this money stuff, uh, for these fighters, ex-fighters. And I'd, li I'd like to know what, how other funds are handling it. I have a suggestion then. So that's two commissioners or three or more, all of us asking for more information. Sure. In which we can benchmark yeah. mm -hmm. this and see maybe what some options are. Can you put together some information, including uh, that would go <coughs> to Gary and Andy, tell us what we can do, what we can't do, with regard to flexibility, uh, and then maybe we could call a special uh, phone meeting. We can notice and have a meeting, so we don't have to wait till the end of February to do something, and just spend some time on this topic, uh, maybe next month. What do you commissioners think about that? I'm, I'm for it. I'm for okay. it. Yes. Okay? Yes. We do, we do, sure, that would be great. Yeah, I'd be happy to do it. At the very least, if we don't take any action, we've learned a lot more. And that would be helpful as well. Of course. Uh, absolutely, I, th I think um, yeah, more information and better understanding is only is only um, helpful. And I, I do want to point out one thing um, as far as the the performance of the fund. While it has been, um, while the top line balance has stayed about the same, um, 
I do um, do take uh, I, am, I do take pride in the fact that because even with these slow and steady um, returns, um, you know we've still had you know almost two million dollars the last several years, almost two million dollars of withdrawals, um, and starting at four point eight oh five, and now we're at um, five oh nine five. So we, it's 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 something, but it could always be better, I, and I definitely recognize that, and I'm happy to work with the commission to make it as well, optimum as possible. To look into that, right? yeah. Let's do that. Sounds good. Appreciate some information. Maybe we could, uh, we'll have a, a, a conversation meeting about that sooner rather than later. Great. Okay, so thank Can you so I ask much. one yeah, question? Um, on this handout, please, annualized performance, there's an asterisk by annualized. What does that mean? Um, I think that may just be, um, it might just be because of the partial year, but. Um, oh, no, it, it says it's actually, it's just re returns are annualized for periods greater than one year. So it's just indicating that's that um, what that what that indicates. So um, essentially, what it means is that that 5.53 is per year for the total portfolio, not not cumulative for that entire period of time. Oh, I see. I see. You got it. Okay. Any other questions for Cyril or Christian? Any, 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 any? No, sir. I just have, I guess, one question, just to be clear. Um, this is, I think, for Beth. Um, on your income statement. Yes. Is this income? No. I just want to make sure that the potential, it's in that, that first big gray box at the bottom. So there's the potential for claims that are out there of 2.5 million. So. Boxers eligible for benefits this year is 806. Yes. Boxers beyond window, 380. Potential link claimants, 1,005,000. Yes. So, so there's 2.5 million claims. A million five has been reabsorbed to active accounts because those were people beyond age 53 who we couldn't find. But they can still claim. If, they, if we find them, we will pay them. Right. So but at this point, their account balances have been reallocated. We're using current year forfeitures to pay them off. And forfeitures are people who have a break in service. Yeah, we're not yeah, using the current forfeiture. There's no forfeiture, but. The, the, yeah. boxer, the current boxers may right. forfeit their benefit if they don't become covered. So that's a forfeiture, because they're not. Yeah, we don't like that word. We don't, we're not, we, had a, we don't like those words. We don't use forfeit. There's no forefit. They didn't Reallocated. They, did, yeah. they weren't vested in their benefit. Okay. They're reallocated. Okay. And right. they got reallocated. That's right. So we use some of that reallocation to pay those um, older boxers who now come back to pay claimants. But the reality is there's 2.5 million of potential claimants out there. Yes. Okay. You're correct. Anything else? Thank you. Both. Thank you very Thank much. You. Happy holidays. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Commissioners, unless there's a violent objection, I think what we will do is go into closed session slash, slash lunch. Uh -huh. And bathroom break. Yeah, I've reached the outer limits of the okay. So bathroom will come back into closed session. We'll have lunch and Great. discuss Andy. Gary, will you stay with us? Of course. Everyone else has to go have lunch. <laughs> and we'll be back, uh, what should we say? Sir, sir, this room um, is special. They won't let you eat it here, sir. It's against the room. But we can't eat it? Yes, sir. Oh, uh, so we can't. So let's just do closed session. We have. Well, we can do closed session. Right, right. Let's just do closed session a little quick. Sorry. Well, we, I think uh, uh, so do I. All right, so let's take a bathroom break, come back, do close session, then we'll go to lunch. Okay. Okay. We are adjourned for five. We are adjourned for five minutes. Are we on with video? Um, Mr. Carvelli, Chair Carvelli, had to leave um, for another engagement. So I will be acting chair, and uh, we do not have a quorum. We, we do. Oh, we do have a quorum. Yes, okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to uh, turn to item 10, the executive officer's report. Uh, Andy? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, um, as the commission knows, um, I haven't had a uh, budget report since July 1st, as we covered earlier, but I do have the revenue numbers. 
Um, and this was as of December 1st. They have went up a little bit since then, but um, 832,762 in the support, 2801 in the Nero fund, and $245,024 the Boxers Pension Fund. 200,000 of that is from the investment account that we had to withdraw and put into the Smith, the checking account to make payouts to Boxers. Um, so, uh, you know, Mark Ito, the budget analyst, says that um, he thinks we'll be around 900, and those were the estimates I gave him. We'll be a little bit higher than 900 through the close of six months. Um, I don't know if we'll have, you know, it's hard to say with our revenue, but we certainly have some good events coming up to build revenue back. We have a class one event in January, one in February, I think we're gonna need two, and we have one in March scheduled. And those are the events that basically, minimum 50 grand, minimum, for the commission's revenue. And then the club shows do the rest, uh, minimum 50 grand. And uh, uh, then we also have in January a, uh, like we call it a class two event, which is like basically 30 grand. So we have pretty two large events coming up. Then on um, uh, moving on on my report, uh, payment of the, uh, the report on the pending and proposed regulations. Uh, the payment of contestants regulation has been submitted uh, uh, final rule rulemaking package to the Office of Administrative Law on November 6, 2017. So that was out of the Um, and, and let me just point out on this one, um, there was some debate early on about whether the commission had the authority for this particular regulation, but the new chief legal counsel and Gary worked together and I got on a conference call with them and there's, it's very clear the commission has authority over contracts. Yes, but it still needs to be determined by the Office of Administrative Law, so. And this is um, for, to help with the C3 logics? Uh, no, ma'am, the $100 minimum purse per round. Okay. Payment of contestants. Oh, that's the payment contestants. Mm -hmm. okay. And then the examination of boxer applicants, um, that's the one you were, you were okay. thinking about. And, and it's the one, um, so it's been um, submitted to DCA for final approval in August 29th. Gary, you got an update on what that's saying? Uh, no, I do not have an update on that, uh, but it is going through my office right now. So uh, this is the, the regulation that we, uh, the commission had uh, started and we withdrew, and so we started it back. Yeah, up. I, I think this is our fourth crack at this thing, because this has been going on for years, literally years. So if we can get this one through, this is gonna be a, and by the way, this was an audit recommendation, so we've gotta get this one through. Right. Um, don't we have people that have said to us if we need stuff getting passed to let them know? We, yes ma'am. Have we followed that avenue? Not on this package yet. Not, if this doesn't pass this time, I'm gonna be making those calls. Okay. This is our fourth time. Okay, you know. and uh, it, it, it wouldn't help furthering it along? I'll do my best. Oh, I'm sorry, this stays at your desk. I know you have a lot literally well, on your desk. It's not, it's not on my, it's through my office. Okay, yeah. okay. Right. And when I say four times, I'm not sure it's been like submitted to the department four times, but we've started the process because I remember having meetings of Tracy Ryan about this package. You remember that? Right. And I just want to point out that this package is <coughs> in the beginning stages. Um, it's following a new regulation process that the department has, and it's going through DCA first before we introduce it with 2OAL. So it goes through that really long, lengthy okay. approval process on the front end versus okay. the back end. And that's actually the basic so change. On the, so you'll see on okay. that flow chart, yes, I there see is an extra difference. step okay. compared to payment of right. contestants. Very good. Okay. Thanks so. for explaining that. Okay. Um, thank you, thank you Sophia. Um, so that's where we're at on the, 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 the reporting of the regulations. Um, now we have our delegated entities. The commission has four delegated entities we have reports from. Um, J Mr. J.T. Steele from CAMO is here.
Good afternoon, commissioners. It's a pleasure to be here. Happy holidays. I'd love to recognize uh, joining me today in the audience is uh, Yvette Briscoe, who I'd just like to introduce you to her because she is a CAMO lead inspector. She's about as committed and dedicated inspector as there really is. Very, very popular and very well liked in Northern California. We appreciate the we countless, countless hours that she, she dedicates to athletes. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your service. So she's wonderful. Um, I wanted to have more to share with you today. Uh, we had some, we were in the midst of planning some inspector trainings uh, and very, it, the, the industry threw me a curve. We were expecting a very slow December and it turned into a very busy December. We have our, we even have an event on the 23rd, so it looks like we get Christmas Eve off this year. <laughs> but we, end, we have a very uncharacteristic, very busy December. Uh, so we pushed back some of our trainings until February. Uh, we have had a lead inspector, um, excuse me, a promoter stakeholder meeting in Southern California. Uh, we were able to get that done before the end of the year, and it was very productive. We got a lot of good insight from our promoters, who are obviously a very important group of stakeholders. We invited our matchmakers as well. Um, they have obviously suggestions and things that they'd like to improve. I think before we bring any of those ideas that they had, I, I'll uh, reserve those to discuss with Executive Officer uh, Andy Foster before we maybe move forward on some of those ideas. Um, but we finished off uh, 2017 with more events than we did in 2018. Uh, there seems to be some trends that we're seeing that have I brought this your attention a few months ago that a lot of these events have been increasing in size. They're getting larger where we have more athletes fighting on cards. And I think we're adapting to adjust to that uh, little bit by little bit. But it's good. The industry appears to be healthy, and and uh, we're excited for what looks to be a, a great 2018. Um, do you have any questions? What do you attribute this upswing in December to? Because that is a really normally a slow period. It, it's, for... you know, part of me thinks it's an anomaly, uh, but we also have. Uh, I tend to think that venues across California have become more costly and more difficult to get venues for fights. It's, it's tough, especially for the small local promoters. Uh, ballrooms and convention centers have been increasingly expensive for our promoters that make it difficult for them to schedule and afford to do shows. I think in December, uh, I think there's been some good opportunities for good venues, people have taken advantage of them. But we also have some new promoters. Uh, we have an event this week, uh, a very well-known amateur promotion, Tough Enough, uh, from Las Vegas, has been a Las Vegas promotion. They will have their first California event uh, this weekend in San Diego. <coughs> so that's fantastic. Uh, we're, very, we're very happy about that. So we're getting some of these larger promoters coming to California from out of state that do amateur shows, doing amateur shows in California, which is great for our state and great for our, for our athletes. Mm -hmm. But if I, if I have a better, hopefully I'll have a better answer as I talk to the promoters at the end of the month, what caused the uptick in December, I'm not sure. Andy, any, any questions for you? No, just to reiterate what he's saying, um, there's been a trend with the promoters of uh, throwing more fights on cards. Okay, that's like an ongoing trend. And I know we have a, a rounds cap that I can uh, uh, amend, and I often do, uh, often do. But um, we ran 23 matches on a show earlier this year, <coughs> and I can assure this commission, unless I see really a good reason, I, we're not going to do that again. 23 matches. We were there. More than double. I think we got there at like one. We started the first spot at three, and we were done at midnight. 
and then you know you're not just you don't just get to run off as soon as it's over so you have to, <laughs> to, 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 to so it, it was um it was a uh, that that one was uh that one was uh, peculiar but uh, jt and i worked together on a, on a club show in san francisco a lot and this particular promoter he will load it up it's fine. I mean, we, we, we love the promotions. We want them to be – because what they're doing is they're trying to get more people to come because they put more people and their fans will come watch them. And we out looking. I try to work with people as much as I can, but the ones that go that long, let me tell you what it does is it degrades the official's ability to concentrate. I agree. And then you, you just get – you start getting these wacky decisions because I'm sitting there like – and it's just not good. So that be, I can't say it any better than Andy said it, but those are some trends that we're seeing. I think really Andy and I should sit down and talk about some of those things. Um, we've been doing this a long time, and I see a trend that I've never seen before with these larger and larger events. How we adapt to it, I think we'll try to come up with a plan and we'll present it to you. And Typically, what you have happen is you let them load them up with some, especially at the early end, because four or five will fall off, and then that's what you got. Well, some what happens when they don't fall off? And they haven't been falling off lately. Yeah. They've all been, everybody's been showing up ready to fight. So that's what's been happening. Yeah. So we we've had some uh, we've had some long nights, and I thank Andy for his support, especially some of those larger ones have been pro ams. And it really requires us both to all work together to make that happen. Um, but we'll continue to monitor it, figure out what the right approach is for our stakeholders and for the commission. And while we're at it, I wanted to just give a shout out because we often forget that the camo officials and camo inspectors, they work hard and they're very, very good and they're very well trained and they do a really good job and we don't often we don't give them kudos often enough and um yeah and they work very well with our with our people especially at these at these pro-am events in fact that was that one what was it friday friday yeah it was friday yeah friday and we had one bout where one of the fight, this fighter won, and he just had a big fa fan base, and none of us were expecting <coughs> him to have such a big fan base, and he sort of surprised us all because two of the fighters, as soon as he won, I mean, two of the fans, as soon as he won, jumped inside the cage, and it just took everybody by surprise, and especially me. I turned around, and the camo inspectors had stood up from the, from the rings from the ringside, and just quietly came and stood behind me, like, just surrounded me, just to make sure that I was okay. And you know, I hadn't expected that was very nice. I mean, just just very pro very professionally created a perimeter. <laughs> I mean, there was I didn't really feel in any danger, but that was just very nice. Um, so. Anyway, I called JT and I told him, you know, thank them. That was that was just a very nice thing to do, and um, they they don't get enough kudos, I think, sometimes. Well, well thank you, and I'll, I'll gladly share those those sentiments with the inspectors because they, they do work hard, and we we love it when we have the opportunity to work with CSAC. It's uh it's great, and we always appreciate Executive Officer Andy Foster's support in those programs because they are they, they do serve an important an important purpose um, and that's about all that I have if you have any other questions I'm happy to answer any of them I see Good news. In, yeah I see in your report that there's some proposed changes coming up and we'll address them in the future so yeah, I, think I just I, I appreciate the heads up and we look forward to the details great we look forward to that and I apologize I did not announce myself for the record I am JT Steele president of camo I thank you JT. sorry thank you Andy, yes, have, have you have you heard from the promoters about a escalating cost of venues? Yes, sir. It um, doesn't really affect uh, TV shows, but it certainly affects our, our the smaller shows like JT's running and all that. And that's why our pro am program, when 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 all of you all of you 
uh, were appointed and, and I was appointed and all the, basically the pro-am market in California was like nil. It was none. Uh, and we run a lot of pro-ams now with JT, a lot of pro-ams with camo. And I think that's good for the industry, but, but it, it is having that effect of creating longer shows. But what it does is it saves the promoter money on the venue. The other thing that, that some of them are doing is renting the venues for Friday and Saturday, yes. and it becomes cheaper. Mm -hmm. So they'll have, you know, maybe a boxing and, and an MMA match Friday and Saturday, and they get, you know, for these regional shows. So they have a lot of promoters, the larger promoters will have feeder shows. So like Golden Boy will have a feeder show, mm -hmm. Top Rank will have a feeder <coughs> show, um, and so they'll, they'll They'll pull their resources and they'll rent the, they'll jointly rent the venue. Okay. Okay. Um, about, um, Madam Chair, at our next, our next uh, uh, on the agenda is USA Boxing. At your request uh, and Commissioner Martha uh, Senior Kita's request, um, you guys asked for Mike McAtee to appear. Uh, he is the uh, executive director of USA Boxing. Uh, and he has flew in from Colorado Springs, and he's here to address the commission about your concerns. Um, and I told him, uh, just a heads up, you guys were going to ask about the fee increases that we talked about last time. Forewarned is forearmed. <laughs> Thank you for coming. If you introduce yourself uh, for the record. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my name is Mike McAtee. I'm the executive director of USA Boxing. Um, and before I get started or answer your questions, I'd like to introduce uh, myself a little bit and then also talk a little bit about USA Boxing that um, a lot of changes that have occurred over the last uh, year, 18 months. So uh, if you would indulge me, I'd appreciate it. First of all, um, I'm honored to be here. Uh, and on behalf of our, our board of directors, um, that we have our 44,000 members of USA Boxing. Over 5,000 of them are here in the great state of uh, California. Um, and California is one of our biggest states when it comes to uh, our membership. Um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, you know, Andy's a, a little bit incorrect. Actually, I flew from Salt Lake City we had just finished our national championships, which were, uh, we were there for seven days of boxing, um, had over 600 boxers and over 500 bouts and four rings. Um, and then I know that there was a discussion about me coming down here in, in October. That was during our Eastern qualifier, uh, where we again had over 600 boxers, uh, almost 500 bouts and four rings over uh, five days of boxing. So. USA Boxing has been doing a lot of work. We've changed um, how we do our selection process, which is giving more opportunities to boxers. A little bit about myself. Um, I started boxing when I was 12. Uh, I boxed uh, about six years. Uh, I competed in silver gloves way back then, where it was called silver mittens. Um, I fought in the Junior Olympics, uh, fought uh, and boxed at the Golden Glove level and uh, competed in the National Golden Gloves in 1982. Um, went to college, did that, and then I sold boxing equipment for approximately seven years. Um, after, and during that time, I uh, trained amateur and professional boxers. Um, I left the boxing equipment business. I was hired by the Lawrence, Kansas Police Department. Um, in June of last year, I retired uh, 25 years as a police detective. Um, and then I was I retired on June 24th. My first day with USA Boxing was June 26th. Um, I was uh, hired as the Director of Boxing Operations. Um, I did that until December of 2016 when um, Mike Martino um, decided to retire based upon um, a lot of things that he did. Um, I was made the uh, Interim Executive Director until June of uh, this year when our board of directors um, voted and made me the executive director. So um, during that last six years of my law enforcement career, I also trained, I had my own gym. 
I did fitness boxing and I also trained um, a lot of masters boxers and uh, some um, kids. So that's kind of my journey of, with USA Boxing and, and how I am here today. Okay. Sounds like USA Boxing is lucky to have you. Well, <laughs> I, I tell everybody I'm very, very fortunate. Uh, my law enforcement career, I always said, was a dream job, and this is a dreamer job. So uh, not very often that you can affect the lives of 31,000 kids um, every single day. So we're, we're very fortunate. Uh, we have a fantastic staff in Colorado Springs. We're enjoying our best relationship in, with years with our foundation and also um, with the USOC and, and also with IEBA. Uh, a lot of that goes to the hard work that Mike Martino did over the last couple of years to uh, get um, our house in order. And we still have a lot more work to do, um, but our culture is changing and I think we're on a very good path. So, do you want to talk about sanctions? Well, so, I guess um, we want to talk about the overall picture of the regulatory um, functions of amateur boxing in California. Um, at, as it relates to the regulatory functions of all the other amateur combative sports as well. Because it took us a long time to get to the relationship with Mike Martino. We loved Mike Martino. It was not a good relationship before we got to Mike Martino. And we want to maintain that really good relationship. Um, we did not want to see him go, actually, because it, it just took so much work to get there. And, um, and then once Mike, you know, sort of retired, it seemed like we were backsliding because we couldn't get anybody from Colorado Springs to come here. And as much as we love Joe Sanders, Joe is from Southern California and doesn't have the overall picture of California and we are required to understand what is going on in California overall. So this is why we ask for somebody from USA Boxing to come. And really it doesn't necessarily have to be somebody from Colorado Springs, but then Colorado Springs has to really appoint somebody to understand the overall picture of California. So I guess you can decide how you want to handle that. Um, and you know you can discuss this with Andy at some point soon um, but our legislation requires that whoever has our delegation for amateur um, for the amateur sports de uh, regulates as well or better than we would and we would know what is going on the big picture in the state of California. So that's the first thing. So when we ask Joe like what is going on in Northern or Central or he's like, <laughs> right? Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is in terms of the licensing fees, um, we received obviously some opinions and some complaints because the fees are going up. Um, and I guess we can talk about that. So we have, from January 1st to November 30th, the collection of total fees from USA Boxing. My understanding is that, and you know, you can clarify for us that the, that the new fee schedule has come out um, and that the new fee schedule is applicable November 1st of 2017 going forward into the new year, right? That is correct. Okay, so so when so these fees are inclusive of November 1st through the 30th, so these have some of the fee collection based on the new fee schedule as well because because this has Athletes at 62, 95, 60, Southern at 65, but I actually think the athletes in Southern California under the new fee schedule is 
Um, the non-athletes is 85. The clubs are 205. So, you know, some of the, so this would not be entirely correct if the collection goes through November 30th. So maybe, and maybe it doesn't, maybe it only goes through November 1st, so m maybe you can get that clarified and get us an updated either with a slash, you know, new fees or just through November 1st. Um, if I can address mm -hmm. the first part of that, this goes through October and it should be November 1, okay? It, does, it ends in <coughs> October. So this uh, is we... all under the old fee system? <coughs> Correct. Okay, so maybe you can get a revised one to us. Yes. The other thing, um, the other question that I would have is, and I don't know, maybe you can clarify this, but based on the total number of fees, it does not appear to me that this includes the police games, which were held in Southern California, or any of the police activity league games, or Golden Gloves or Silver Gloves, or any of the possible elite games. Um, those probably should be added because those would be sanctioned by USA Boxing, right? Um, they were not. The, no? The, the police games were not sanctioned by USA Boxing. Uh, and I can address that. It, it may be easier uh, for me to start at the beginning because okay. uh, I think I can answer a lot of your questions just with the process by which we uh, adjusted our sanction fees. Um, part of my job was a complete overview of USA Boxing, our policies and procedures. And everything that I will talk about will be based upon numbers of 2016. And if you would like, it's uh, the memo uh, that I wrote, which was uh, voted on by our board of directors in June and put into place, was uh, our new board of our board of directors meeting in December. Those minutes were um, approved, and they will be online in totality sometime this week. Um, my whole staff was in Salt Lake City all week, and they got home on Sunday. But initially, USA Boxing issued 1,643 sanctions across the country. Um, of those sanctions, 1,043 are club shows, just regular boxing shows. Nothing had changed in those, um, in those sanction fees. Uh, we had not changed them. We did not um, change them whatsoever or do any requirements. Of those, Sanctions 211 are, were Junior Olympics. Um, USA Boxing does not charge for Junior Olympic sanction fees. Uh, that <coughs> another 155 sanctions were issued to Golden Gloves, and 53 were multi-day tournaments. And then lastly, 26 um, third-party sanctions um, were also issued. The major change to um, our sanctioning process um, engaged the 26 that happened all over the country. And I'll give you a little bit of background. Um, we spend about $875,000 in insurance and deductible. Um, so if you did the, the simple math, which is, uh, if, as an actuator or when it comes to insurance, um, $875,000 divided by um, 1643 comes down to approximately $532 per boxing show per sanction. USA Boxing charges our LBCs $300. So initially or essentially USA Boxing underwrites $232 of each show um, to our members. The LBCs have the ability to add on to um, that sanction fee. Um, and that is what you see um, in the four LBCs here in, in California that if you look in the column under sanctions, um, the sanction for, if you start at the top of the page, uh, Cal Border adds 50, um, the Central adds 188, the um, LBC portion for Northern is 150, Southern California is 25. So that is voted upon by the Board of Governors. 
Can you guys see this? I, I'm sorry. No. It's the last column. So if you go to oh, I got it. the LBC portion, go all the way to the end, oh, yeah. $50. I see, I see it now. I see. Sorry. Okay. Uh -huh. One of the major changes on that, USA Boxing gave allowances to every LBC that they could, every year, uh, they could increase that up to three times that amount. Mm -hmm. um, we felt that that was excessive, and, and most of our LBCs didn't do any of that. However, any time a fee change that will be addressed at the local level, that has to be voted on by the Board of Governors of that LBC, and the Board of Governors comprises of the LBC leadership and the boxing gyms. So essentially, if they choose to raise fees, they have to be voted up upon by the members of that LBC, and that was one of the major changes. Um, so it's not USA Boxing making general changes or LBC leaders that the boxing coaches themselves would have to vote on that. But that's just the LBC sanction fees for them having a, an event. Correct, okay, well, from not, any event. That, but that's not the licensing fee that the athlete pays to USA Boxing. That's Correct. just, we're just talking about the sanction fees. Correct. Okay, when, when so you, wait, hold on, I'm sorry, just one second. When you're talking about the Junior Olympics, the Golden Gloves and those kinds of things, when, and not charging sanction fees, the athlete, when the athlete goes, the athlete is still paying a, a fee to go. Yes and no, depends on the, the event. And here, I'll explain. USA Boxing charges their, we have a membership fee, and if you look in the first column, for all boxers, the, um, we charge, our base rate is $50. The LBC, take for instance in Cal Berkeley, or Cal Border, will add $12 to, to that. Starting in November 1, and if we're gonna start with the athlete fees, our computer system, we had a $3 convenience fee because it's online and, and that pays for the computer system. So it was $50 what USA Boxing would charge. Mm -hmm. The LBC would add what some LBCs add zero, some add a, a small amount, others add, and we had that range. At the end of the process, a $3 convenience fee was added. It caused a lot of confusion. So what we've done for starting November 1, that $3 is just added into the boxer's fee as opposed to on the back end, but we increased it from $3 to, to $5. So there's been a $2 increase um, across the country. And the reason we did that, um, we found that our LBCs uh, leadership lack training. Um, our coaches uh, lack training and our officials. So by our policy, that $2 that we collect uh, from every member uh, of USA Boxing and the sanctioned fees is required and earmarked for training at the grassroots level only. So it does not go into our general fund. We provided um, training at the LBC level in Colorado Springs for all our LBCs. Um, and that was in two sessions, one in August and one in September. Uh, it cost us about $60,000. Um, and we will continue to do that. Um, next year, we're slated to bring uh, our chief of officials and coaches, representatives out to Colorado Springs. And that will be that amount of money that will be um, spent. When it comes to fees when it comes to participate in boxing events. Mm -hmm. Golden Gloves, and there were a uh, Golden Glove franchise here in California, charged, I believe it was $15 to participate in that um, event. That is against Golden Gloves uh, bylaws and rules, mm -hmm. and uh, the Golden Glove franchise was notified uh, about that, and that will not be happening in the future. Uh, when it comes to our national tournaments, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, later on because there was a discussion about what USA Boxing wants to do for LA 2028, we charge $25 uh, fee uh, to our, our boxers to participate. Coaches aren't charged. Essentially, 
um, to put on a national tournament, we spend about $180,000 to put a tournament on, uh, and that helps cover the cost, um, a small portion of the cost of, of those tournaments. So when it comes to fees that are collected at the local level, those do not come to USA Boxing. So if a, a, an, um, a boxing club decides to have a boxing show and they charge $10 for a boxer to participate in that. Um, they keep that. They keep it. They keep 100% of it. And these sanction fees, like, let's say there's a private show and they're charging $1,755 or a third party charity and they're charging a sanction fee of $1,505, those don't go to USA Boxing or they do? Part goes to USA Boxing, part goes back to the LBC, and I can explain why that fee went up. Um, majority of our um, two things, and, I, and I'll go in order, just I apologize because it's a little easier for me to do it chronologic, chronologically. Our Pro-Am shows fees did not change. One of the things that we realized and discovered is that we issued 155 um, sanctions for Golden Gloves. However, they had 352 boxing days. So we believe that our board of directors believe that it was unfair. If you're a, a small club and you put on, and, and I'll use Colorado because I know those numbers. Um, if you put on a, a boxing show in Colorado and you have a club, it's the <coughs> sanction fee is $300. They add, I believe, 50. So a, a club show in Colorado was $350, $355 now. Previously to this change, the Golden Gloves would put on a four or five day tournament and pay $355. It's the same amount of risk, and yet we are charging our small clubs more because they put on four days of boxing. They would be paying four sanction fees in Golden Gloves would pay one sanction fee, and we had some Golden Gloves on the East Coast that would have 10 to 15 boxing days. So um, we believe that that was um, unfair. What risk? What risk? Yeah. Uh, the risk that, you know, it's part of covering our insurance, and every time... But uh, they're paying the insurance, right? No, they're not. They're paying a portion of the insurance. If you remember what I said, we, we pay $875,000, 1,642 sanctions. If you did the simple math, um, it's 542. So USA Boxing subsidizes. But hold on, that's for certain shows. If they're having a club show, isn't, aren't the LBCs required to pay for insurance? And isn't each, aren't each of the athletes also required to buy insurance? There, no. So every okay. time an LBC, every time an LBC has a club show, so every time an LBC has one of these club shows, say in Southern California or Northern or Northern LBC, USA Boxing covers the insurance. They, a portion of it. What portion of it? What percentage of it? Would um, be about like I don't know, like thirty percent. Just doing okay. quick math, thirty-five percent. Actually, it's about. more. It's more like sixty percent. Because an average club show would be five hundred thirty-two dollars. Oh, y'all cover the five thirty-two. We it's five thirty-two. We cover three hundred out of the fees. Okay. Well, I so, thought you said it was eight seventy-five. Though would be the simple well, amount. Well, actually, I don't know. We, if, you're right. You're. You, excuse I don't know me. If it actually works out that way because it's a massive policy, right? It's a big policy. So I went through this with Mike, and I went through this with Anthony, I went through this with sure. So it's a huge policy. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it breaks, you know, I don't know how you can statistically break it down to like this percentage. Of the, it's a huge policy, which covers a, a much bigger, you know, a, a, a much bigger area and a much bigger. So I was not, none of us were able to say, well, because you know there are this many I mean it depends on how many shows you have and how many days and how many so I don't you know you can only look at it in retrospect and say 
because in this particular year you had this many shows and there were this many athletes and there was this many, this is the amount of risk that was allocated to each show. I don't know that you can sit here now and say in this prospective year we are going to be covering 60% of you understand what I'm saying? Because it's a big policy. I, I do, but like I'm talking about just just granularly looking at the gross aggregate of these numbers. Just I think it's I think it's impossible to say because it's risk. It's 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 insurance risk, and I don't think that any actuary is going to be able to tell you that that's what you're covering because USA Boxing is buying a policy which it's buying much cheaper than any of them could, and each athlete is required to carry insurance as well. That, that, that's not correct. Um, so just from the, our standpoint of how we went through the numbers, we actually looked at our insurance that was is broken down in our policy, is a massive policy. I mean, we have you know, kidnapping insurance for our teams that go overseas. Um, and looking at it and went through it with our CFO and the particular items that pertain to um, putting on a show or putting on an event. We also have coverages of the individuals. So that's why to make it as close as possible and we'll always be a year behind because I actually use numbers from 2016 but our our amount of sanctions have actually stayed fairly consistent. Where we we did not capture, and I'll have better data for 2018 because we did not track, we track sanctions, not boxing days. In actuality, we had probably over 1,800 boxing days, but only issued 1,643 sanctions, 1,643. So you're right in that each show is a little bit different when it comes to risk. The ones that we focused on and that our board of directors was very particular about is the club shows, the grassroots shows, there was no change except for the $2 sanction fee. What we did look at and what is the biggest risk that we ran into were third party sanctions and I'll explain that. Third party sanctions and if you, if you look at our our bylaws and you look at the Ted Stevens Sports Act you know we are responsible for indirect and direct competition to the world championships and the Olympic Games over the last few years probably last 10 years there's been a, a huge growth in guns and hoses police against fire charitable events that would raise money for police and firefighters families uh, that killed the line of duty, and, uh, and I'll tell you, as a uh, as a police detective, I fought in two guns and hoses um, to help raise money for uh, police and fire in the Kansas City area. It's it's a great great um, program, and we do it all over the country. But that's not really our mission. Our mission is kids, and so um, I'll take an example, and this is an extreme. St. Louis Guns and Hoses has been around since the 80s. And in 2016, their net profit was $695,000. That of that $695,000, they wrote a check to USA Boxing, the local LBC. However, uh, they said, all the cops and firefighters or police officers and firefighters, you need to pay the registration fee out of that. We want you to promote it. You also need to take the uh, rental of the uh, boxing ring out of that. At the end of the day, the local LBC um, was paid $2,000. Of that $695,000, that went to police and fire. In my mind, that charity starts at the home. And that our new process is that if you want to, and we are on the hook for the 18,000 people that were there drinking, and people, police officers and firefighters who are competing, um, okay, we made $2,000 for our LBC, but USA Boxing's on millions of dollars worth of risk if and when 
one of them get hurt. And from my uh, experience, it's not if a boxer gets hurt, it's when. And that's why you all, and Andy does a fantastic job to protect the health and safety of it. My thought is, is that USA Boxing needs to protect our sport. And if individuals want to make money off of uh, amateur boxing, in this case for another charity, however, they need to donate money to USA Boxing. And I'm not talking about the national office. The way we have set this up, that it's money going back to the LBC. So when it comes to a $1,500 sanction, a third party sanction, and the one that was brought to your attention, um, and I read the minutes, um, in February, we put a notice out to everyone in, that it had a third party sanction, that we were changing the process, February of 2017. And so when it comes to risk now, we have a formula that it's $1,505, or 5% of the net. If then, um, I'll give you an example. Um, Haymakers for Hope in Massachusetts has raised over $6 million over the last six years for cancer um, research. So what we did on theirs is we, and I don't know the math off the top of my head, but let's say it, it was $100,000. 5% would be, uh, do the math real quick, $5,000, $15,000. I think theirs ended up being a $20,000 sanction. And so their sanction fee started off this year at 20,000. They donated, so you take 20,000 minus 1,500. They donated money to the LBC 3,000, so now we're at 4,500. They hired USA Boxing coaches to train the participants and spent about $17,000 that went to direct support to USA Boxing gyms and coaches. All of those were factored in and came out of that $20,000 sanction fee to the point their sanction fee that they paid to USA Boxing was 1,500 dollars, but the rest of that money uh, went to the LBCs. This is, I'm just going to jump in here because we're going on 25 minutes and you know clearly there's huge changes and important changes and sounds like perhaps some very good changes um, and it's not something that I don't think we can address right now uh, carefully like we need to and um, I think this is a problem because um, we haven't had any connection or feedback or information from USA Boxing for a long time. Um, uh, months, mm -hmm. a couple of meetings. And so, um, yeah, I, where we go from here is we need to have a representative from USA Boxing to be here at our, our meetings to keep us up to speed, because this is way too much for us to do right now and feel like we're, we're, we understand it. We don't have any, you know, at a minimum we should have had, you know, a memo about explaining what you're trying to tell us orally right now. I mean, this, um, it's, it's, it's too much for us to, um, to understand and to, you know, approve and analyze and, and things like that. And it's very important. It's very important for our constituents. It's very important for, for you, obviously, for what you're doing. And it could be a very good thing, um, but we need to understand it. Um, so one thing I want to make sure, it doesn't have to be you that comes out at every meeting, but we'd like someone, you know, a representative and not our local LBCs, uh, someone from, from Colorado or from your office that you can send if you can't come. We would love to have a relationship with you, um, but I do realize that you, like you said, you had a conflict for our last meeting. Um, I would like to say that if you said that um, the new f sanctioning schedule is coming out online, you said this week, next week? No, it will be up. Um, my guess it will be up tomorrow um, because the minutes were approved and that was uh, voted upon in June. So our board of directors approved the minutes. It was part of that. I can provide all that information uh, to Andy, and he can provide that all to you this week. We used to have access to WetPoint 
and we no longer do, maybe somebody can, because we actually participated with the, you know, when it went up and maybe, maybe somebody can provide us access to it again so that we can look at the injury reports and, you know, things like that, because those, I mean, we require all of our other delegates to provide us with that information so we can look at it and, um, and this report is great with the financials, but we actually have other requirements as well. We want to look at, you know, the injuries, we want to look at everything going on in California. And that will, you know, make it a lot easier for all of us. Um, so maybe that's another thing you can talk to him about. And generally speaking, we would like to know everything that is collected you know, not just through the LBCs, but if they're, because at some point, I know Andy, we, you know, we talked about this, that the police um, tournaments would go through, you know, this educational, you know, whatever thing, but that only happened like at some point in 2017. There were other events that were sanctioned by USA Boxing, and I do not think those are on here. So we want to know the entire, no, because I was part of this decision, so I wanted to know the entire income stream that, and you know, the probably, probably was before your time as well, so I wanted to know the entire income stream that came from California um, in 2017, and then Really, what we also want to know is, you know, I saw in the newsletter the pie graph that said 26% was spent back to the LBCs. Well, how was that actually spent? Because when you say the elite games, well, how is that actually spent in California, not in the LBCs throughout the country? But we're, we're not concerned with Massachusetts. We're concerned with California. So that's what we would like to know. The, and just for clarity on my part, um, that 26% would have been the aggregate or the total of all states where this right. is what's specific to you. Right. When it comes to um, in a, every sanction that was issued in the state of California is captured in this document. I can tell you that the, the police games that happened in LA was not sanctioned by USA Boxing. No, that's, that's not what I'm talking about. There were, there, there's like a police officer who, who, has, who had some events in Northern California and originally it started out being sanctioned through USA Boxing. We figured out another way to do it. That, anyway, there were some conflict. It's not the police and fire games, it's not the police Olympics, it's not, it's something else entirely. I think it was probably before you. But anyways. The, the um, question I have for, and, and sorry to interrupt is, do you, of the, our sanctions that were issued here were 168. Are you saying now that if a boxing club charges a fee for a boxer to participate that we don't have any record of, nor would we even know what that is, you're requiring that I have to provide that? In the past, USA Box, yes, because we want to know what is going on with the amateur bus. So this is the issue. If you're going to be responsible for amateur boxing in California, you are responsible for all of amateur boxing in California, okay. and you need to be responsible. And in the past, what the problem that we have had with USA Boxing is you only care about amateur boxing when it gets to a certain tier. And the lower tier ones, where it's only the LBCs that are responsible, until it gets to the you know the pre-Olympics, USA Boxing is like whatever you know you deal with it. LBCs. Well, we can't regulate that. We we don't know what's going on. And if something happens, well, who's gonna know? They're not reporting to you. They're not reporting to us. We have no idea. And this is the problem. If we are giving you the delegation to regulate amateur boxing, you better be regulating and knowing what is going on with amateur boxing. So this is why you have to be responsible for all of amateur boxing, not just when it gets to the elite tier. 
Um, if I could make a suggestion here, is that when the um, uh, when that memo is available, if you can forward it to Mr. Foster, and then Andy, if you can send it uh, to the commission, and then um, after we've reviewed it, perhaps if we could schedule a telephone conference mm -hmm. um, to just answer our you know questions and um, you know just to start getting on the same page so we understand right. each other. Right. Is that does that sound like a that, that's not a problem. Okay. Um, and, and I'd look forward to it. I guess um, just a little confused. Um, this is the first I've heard that you uh, need that information, but uh, you know we can uh, surely well, provide it, and that's why we have that. That's that. exactly what you don't know what right. we want, and you know we don't have understanding. So this is exactly why it's important. Um, we're going to ramp it up, try to get on the same page, take a little you know time outside of the regular meetings, but we need. Um, you or an, or an important competent delegate to come to each meeting and with the with the report more than I think just this one letter or these are how many you know things we want to know that here's this there's a new sanctioning schedule that's coming out this you know we, we, we care I'll, I'll, I'll work with Andy about okay. um, more in-depth reporting yeah it was my understanding that uh, we were in compliance, and I apologize if we're not, uh, and uh, we'll do a better job. We're going to get on the same page. It's all going to be good. Thank you. Okay. For with us. And thank you for coming and waiting patiently. All right. Could, could, uh, I'm sorry, do you have any You questions? spoke about uh, uh, the Olympics in 28. Did, yes. did you not say that there was some information you were going to convey about the, the, uh, the Olympics? Yes. I, That's, I, I would like to, but I... Or well, do I please, still have time? Please go ahead. My apologies, yeah, I think please. I'd be inter very interested in, in, in that. The, um, obviously, LA uh, is going to be the Olympic uh, host in 2028. As part of the um, process for them to get uh, to 2028, um, between the International Olympic Committee, uh, uh, LA bidding, and contractual obligations, um, LA is slated to get $10.8 million a year over the next uh, 10 years, um, and that money has to be directed towards youth sports. I've uh, contacted our liaison between the USOC um, and um, LA 2028. Uh, they're very excited about um, amateur boxing um, uh, because of the uh, great boxing we have in the state. Um, our Olympic, our qualifying of how we've done it this year will be the same as next year in that Albuquerque is our Western qualifier, Chattanooga, Tennessee is our qualifier for 18, but starting in 19 and 20, um, we will be putting out new RFPs. I've already reached out to Joe Zanders and I left Salt Lake City, went to LA, met with him um, Sunday night. I met with Robert Rodriguez uh, yesterday um, and met with um, Frank, while, Frank <coughs> while he was in Salt Lake City. So we are going to reach out to possibly make our Western qualifier um, in 19 and 20. Um, we would like to uh, work with uh, LA 2028. And about putting our Western qualifier in, um, in LA for 19 and 20. Um, and then also we're, we're looking at, and they're looking at partnerships because the average age of our boxers that competed in the Olympics were 19 and a half years old. 10 years from now, our nine-year-olds are gonna probably make up, a, uh, if things hold true, 19 year, or nine-year-olds are gonna be making up our team in 2028. Um, there's a big push from the USOC to start working with Junior Olympic programs and so we're going to be also try to work with Junior Olympic pro programs to provide more opportunity uh, for young people in the state of California and or specifically in LA for more opportunities. So um, we're starting our strategic plan which goes all the way out to 2028 um, so we can do more events in the state of California. Wow. Fascinating. We're, we're very fortunate and we're, um, the USOC, USA Boxing is uh, extremely excited about the possibility over the next 10 years of increasing 
uh, USA Boxing presence in California. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, other Dr. questions? Dr. Williams, do you have any questions? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for coming, and we look forward to communicating. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. And next on our agenda, Mr. Foster. Next, Madam Chair, is Steve Fossum with the IKF. You again. Nice. Merry Christmas and happy holidays to everyone. Steve Awesome, president of IKF Kickboxing. I have a summary here of uh, basic general stuff that we have accomplished since our delegation. I'm going to run through and I only have one question for you guys at the very end to help us with, with uh, improving some of the things that we've been doing. After this coming weekend, the IKF will have sanctioned 51 events in 2017. This is up uh, two events from last year when the IKF sanctioned 49 and in 2015 <coughs> it sanctioned 52. The first year of the IKF delegation was a partial year from March 17th to the end of the year in which we sanctioned 30 events. After this coming weekend, since the IKF was delegated to oversee amateur kickboxing and Muay Thai by the California State Athletic Commission on March 17th, 2014, the IKF will have sanctioned or regulated a total of 182 events. During this time, the IKF has licensed and regulated over 2,200 amateur kickboxers and Muay Thai fighters, along with just under 1,900 trainers from California and several other states across the USA, along with Mexico and Canada. Of the almost 1,900 trainers, approximately 80 of them train junior fighters under the age of 18 and currently hold an AB 2007 Concussion and Youth Sports Training Course Certificate. The IKF continues to be the only sanctioning body worldwide to have an active database and ranking system for both amateur and professional kickboxers and Muay Thai fighters. And the IKF continues to be the only sanctioning body worldwide that keeps a consistent record of events result in results to track fighter activity. The IKF has accomplished all of this with a working event official staff of less than 50 officials. Our goal is not just to license officials to attain license fees, but the goal of our training officials, led by Chief IKF official Dan Stell, is to create high quality officials as well as work with existing good kickboxing and Muay Thai officials already licensed with the California State Athletic Commission. The IKF is proud to be a part of the California State Athletic Commission's sole sport delegation of amateur fight sports. Due to that sole delegation by only one sanctioning body per fight sport, California is not only the safest state for amateur fight sports, but also the, the only state in the USA who has put forth an effort through the work of the IKF to organize fight sports of kickboxing and Muay Thai as they have done for amateur boxing, MMA, and pancreation. With that being said, we only have one thing that I hope you guys can help me with. Um, we had an issue happen at one of our events a couple weeks back where we had a fighter get knocked out and I mean out cold. One of the worst knockout, knockouts our staff had seen. And our, uh, our attending physician that was working the event is a CSAC doctor. Uh, his requirement or request was for the fighter to go by ambulance to the hospital. And the ambulance crew came in and the fighter at that point was awake and alert. And uh, when the ambulance crew came in to take him, he was adamant he did not want to take an ambulance ride, didn't want to go in the ambulance. Uh, our doctor argued with the situation. The ambulance crew pulled out a form, had the guy sign a form that says he's uh, denying an uh, ambulance ride to the hospital. And uh, at that point it was over. There was nothing we could do because the ambulance company now wouldn't take him. They said that their liability is off the hook. And our doctor obviously was upset because the question now was, do we, well, first question is, do we need to have a form? Because I'm not sure if this has ever happened with the California State Athletic Commission when they regulated amateurs or even on the pro side. That's my first part of the question. My second part of the question is, at that point, who assumes, if anybody, liability of that fighter? Because obviously our doctor was very, very clear he wanted him to be transported, to be checked out. Um, they said later that, his parents took him to the hospital, okay, which we have no proof, no idea if that ever happened, okay. So that's out of all the things that have happened since, last, since the last athletic commission or last uh, uh, CSAC meeting, 
that's really the biggest thing that I really want to address to you guys is see where you can give us guidance and help to what you think we should do. How old is he? Uh, I believe he was 20, in his 20s, I'm from so, so. Well, I mean, legally, you cannot, unless, um, you know, unless he's a 5150, you cannot tie the guy him. down and force him into an ambulance. Yeah, we found that out. <laughs> so <laughs> there, there's some other exceptions, but yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, basically, unless there's some reason that you have, you know, or, or um, there's competency issue, you know, there's, you cannot force the person into, but having said that, I know I've been at some pro fights where, I know we had one incident where this fighter did not, it was an M MMA event, and this fighter did not <coughs> want to go to the hospital, did not, and, we, and he, he had to be transported. It was like, remember the knife wound? In the, anyway, did not disclose the knife wound. And um, the doctors basically said to him, you, if you don't go, I mean, he wasn't gonna fight again, but if you don't go, you will be guaranteeing that you will never, ever, ever have a chance, to f you will never fight again. And I think that convinced him that he was at least gonna take a trip to the hospital. See, suspensions, fines, that all crossed our mind, but our focus was, I mean, it delayed the event an hour. Not, you know, I'm not worried about the delay. No, the point it was, being is the discussion. It was not even all a suspension. Took an hour of what were, to do. They, the doctors just said, and with the inspectors, and I don't know. I think you were there, but I don't know if you. Talk, you will never fight again. That's because of it. his health condition, physically, what happened to him, health-wise, is what you're saying. Not just because he was suspended, because he didn't want to take it right. No, he was. will never fight again because. And who knows if we could really. I don't, you know, I don't think so, but it was the doctors that were saying, they were just trying to get him to go, to him to and, go. And, and, and he needed to go. But do not condone that activity. Yeah. People have the right to refuse treatment, no, this, and this, you cannot, no, no, no. This wound was but you can do it for a medical, you can give medical advice that if you don't go medically, you might not be able to fight again, this but you wound, cannot threaten sanctions or suspensions. No, there was no inspector, there was not, this hey. was the doctors telling me this wound was such that this person may have, you, you know what I mean? We, we have on our medical form that everybody, you know, that we give, there's a box on there that they have to sign, refuses medical treatment or refuses medical care or whatever. Now, it's not too often that one gets signed and I don't know if it releases the commission from liability or not. It's on the form. I can't recall somebody signing that, but it's there. You know, the only, the other thing that would concern me about that is people do have a right to refuse medical care, you're right. Uh, but in the case of a head injury, the question is, did they have mental, you know, competency, competency, mental faculty to make, you know, there's something you know, called agnosia where people can have injury and be unaware of their injury. They, they really do think they're fine, mm -hmm. uh, but they're not. Well, every fighter thinks they're fine. I don't know if you remember Red One Megara from the Draca yeah. situation years yeah, ago. Yeah, Red One was not fine. Yeah, we have a whole article about it still on our website yes. when he got knocked out, but we found out he had also gotten knocked out two or three times before on a Native American land, on two, like two or three Native American land shows. And when he filled out his form in January, the way the form at that time read was, have you been knocked out within this year? And he argued, or they argued, well that meant from January on. Mm -hmm. And he had been knocked out in like October, November, and December, like three months in a row, three different knockouts. And he, when, he went, when it was all done with him, he jumped up in the ring, was yelling and screaming, I'm okay, I'm okay. Went back in the locker room, collapsed, and I think he died either Sunday or Monday right after the show. was the last person to die in California. Yeah, so, uh, so my point being with this is, I don't know if JT has ever experienced this or with USA Boxing, if they've ever had this happen to them, it'd be nice if they could chime in. But it's a liability issue that we all have to probably should be thinking about. I understand he, has, he or she has the right to refuse service or you know, the, the right, confident. but at the same time, what if he dies? Now we're dealing with his family, his friends or whatever. 
is there a liability issue there? We should throw a red flag up and try to have the right form that all of us entities have that person sign. Um, that's that's clearly states what the situation is and and who signs that form like you said he could be a, a head injury sign the form and they'll argue later well he was out of it in the first right. place you know so who who is liable to sign that form with that fighter the trainer you know i mean there's there's it, let's just say it opened up a whole big can of worms for us to wonder about how do we deal with it and he know? was 20 what if he was yeah well minor. if he was under 18 we'd have the parents to deal with okay which I'm pretty confident the way we, the way our staff was handling it, if he was under 18, he would have went. Okay, but, but then again, what if the parents said, no, we don't want any medical treatment? You know, I'm just saying that it just opens up a whole can of worms of, do we as entities as well as CSAC themselves for the pro side, do we have a form that really covers us if someone jumps up and says, I'm fine. I don't, want, I don't want to go to the hospital and passes out in the locker room. Cover yourself a hundred percent in situations like that because it's, you know, there's always that risk, and that's why you know that's why we try to regulate this business has risks. Um, I know when I represented uh, hospitals, you know, and the ambulances, and I mean they always spend a lot of time talking. And you know when you pick up a homeless, if they get run over by a car or what, you know they always spend a lot of time talking to them, talking to them, talking to them because they don't want to leave them because you never know, you just never know. It's a there's always risks. So from a legal standpoint, should all of us have the same form that we have that fighters or parent or whatever or whoever the responsible party is? Should all of us try to work to have? one form that we all use or should we each have our own individual forms or the prob- what's better the for problem all is is that in order to determine competency to sign that form it's a medical issue so really only a doctor can determine is this person competent to refuse treatment so with that said is this something we should we could ask the MAC to help with because you guys deal with this issue all the time. I think that's something we should definitely put on the a MAC agenda and and discuss because I, I, I agree. I think it's different as a government entity and as a private entity. And I also think it's probably different on the amateur level and on the professional level. Exactly. You guys, if I can chime in with JT, do you, you ever had that happen to you? Yes. What did you guys do? The commission welcomes Mr. JT Steele for his input. JT Steele with the camel. Um, you know, in these type of situations, when we think about liability, we need to think about negligence. Negligence really happens in two ways. One, it's negligence per se, which we have a rule or a statute or a form which we don't effectively execute and creates negligence. Or our standard, our conduct falls below a standard of care, which would be the reasonable person, or in this case, the reasonable commission. So I don't think that a form is going to protect us or shield us entirely from liability. It's our conduct. And in this type of a situation, I think if you look at what you did, it is you used every effort that you could as a reasonable commission to protect that fighter, right? If you, if you reach beyond that and violate the rights of the athlete, force him in the ambulance, we could, again, then we could also be in. So it's tough, you know, obviously I think we need to do every, what we, the way we have handled this situation is we have told them that the repercussions of not going in the ambulance according to the doctor's orders is we will execute and use all of our suspension power to make sure that their decision to not ride in the ambulance is outweighed by severe suspensions and that's what we've done oh i because you have to be careful about that well we suspend you can't indefinitely you have you have to have a medical reason for suspension but you can't punitive use punitive we didn't put that thing for for, for sure yeah Yeah. if the the doc if the doctor's orders are to go in the ambulance and that's what the doctor's ordered they still have a right to refuse 
they, they, just, they can have a religion, for example, they, that, that they, doesn't that doesn't believe in medical treatment at all. People have a right to refuse. They, they, they can. They still have a medical issue that they have to go and resolve before they have they can so, be allowed to fight. But if if they are to ever come back, that is when it can become uncomfortable for them. They will know that they will need to provide a certain amount of documents from doctors, because at that point, it's really coming back. Is what they're suspended. They, they, you know, they left unwillingly, which they can do. But we have the right to suspend for discipline. We have, the, you know, we have a lot of unfettered discretion, in, in, as far as rules and regulation goes, with in, enforcing suspensions for disciplinary issues. So, in that case, what we do is we make sure the return to competition is a very strict and safe and safe full neuro MRIs it's not going to be easy and we make them know that as possible one thing that we have found the most effective I think in this situation is the coaches especially when the athlete is disoriented and confused uh, and making bad decisions we let the coach know hey this is not going to go well for your fighter and we bring the coach into that because sometimes it's a coach or a parent that can think rationally in that situation, and uh, that's what we tend to do. Sadly, in our case, listen. we had the coach and the parents telling him he doesn't have to go in the ambulance, <laughs> and that's that was probably the most disturbing thing for our staff and the doctor was hearing the coach say, "You know, you don't have to go." And what we kind of evaluated after when we did a a discussion on it was we were wondering well maybe they didn't understand the insurance maybe they thought they had to pay for that ride was there like a language barrier or something like that yeah. well then you have some compare I mean if there is any kind of like then you have some comparative and if there even is a liability you know because you have somebody intervening and they're telling him, him or her that they don't have to go so and, and the suspension that we put on we opted not to do a disciplinary suspension for the exact reasons you were talking about. We just, we did a general 180, but can only return with neuro and uh, some other tests that the doctor was requiring. So they had to still go through those particular tests because, well, like anything, nobody really knows what happens to a unless they're checked out, you know, especially with secondary impact syndrome, for example. So, you know, we made it very clear that they, this fighter had to go through those things if they're going to return, so. Okay, so I think, I think this is a very good issue, and thank you for bringing it up. I think that we deal with it in the pro, but maybe not the amateur. So I think that we should um, uh, refer it to the MAC. Yeah. I, I definitely agree with you. I think that there is a significant difference in professional licensing mm -hmm. than there is in the amateur level, you know. Uh, there are some definitely different issues mm -hmm. and it's to, really to be case concerned about. case too because it depends on the fighter it depends on the injury it depends on who's with them it depends on how many fights they've had it depends on you, you know it's a, it's a very unique in each situation I think yeah, our, our staff went out of the way and I was very proud of how they handled it even the doctor of how they handled it as much as they wanted adamantly to take him in the ambulance they finally just had to say you know we have no rights here you know, basically, and uh, you know, they, they saw it, the ambulance company had, had signed a form, and that's where our red flag went up. You know, well, we need to have a, a form like that. However, we decide our legal. The doctor's still basically. liable because the doctor can only turn patient care over to someone equally as qualified or above, and there wasn't a doctor. Have you had it happen in the pros where the, where the guy just doesn't want to take a ride? And what do you do? Just does the ambulance company ever make him sign a form? You ever had that? You're supposed to transport, that's the protocol. Yeah, I'd rather not. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. No, so I something to be well, I just want to say I agree with uh, Commissioner Lehman. A, a form I don't think is going to take care of the problem because ultimately it's going to be a decision, a med it's a medical decision to determine whether or not the person is competent to even sign that form. So it, that's not going to help. So, you're, so hypothetical here, the doctor has that decision. He's still adamant, you need to go. We're not gonna pick him up and put him in the ambulance physically. Doctor's adamant, and he was, that he needed to go. The <coughs> correct Shut doctor up. would know. I mean, I've been a medic for 30 years. You know, part of my training is to recognize people have the right to refuse care. 
and we carry AMA against medical advice forms and so um, a doctor should know that as, that they have the right to refuse care. But they do sign forms. Yes, and, and but the doctor, it would be surprising to me the doctor wouldn't have their own forms in doing this work. I've never seen a form, even with working with CSAC mm -hmm. events years ago, even like 10 years ago. Well, we do have that, and it's in the, it's so in the emergency room, it's in the ambulance, it's in the, everybody has them because people walk out all the time. Okay. All right, well, I'll be interested so to hear delegated. what, cool. what you guys okay, find you. out when that comes yeah. up on the Thank you, an important issue. issue. Thank you for bringing that Anything to our else attention. At all, um, great report. Thank you very and much. And thank you for all you do for um, California. Um, Vice Chair Lehman, uh, uh, John Frank sends his uh, regrets that he was unable to attend. He's ill today, um, but he has his report inside the packet. Yes. I noticed that there were proposed um, new regulations in his new, new rules. Yes, ma'am. Should we, I wonder, wait to discuss those when he's here next yeah, time? Here. Yes, yes, ma'am. Okay, so we'll, we'll table that. Okay, um, and then just a brief update on the C3 Logic Concussion Management Program. I spoke to Dr. Williams yesterday about this because I was working to get the numbers. Because, uh, you know, the goal, the goal initially was 300 and then we revised it up to 500 because we were getting it done. Uh, as of uh, yesterday, we were at 473 uploads. We got three events this weekend. I feel confident we're going to get to 500. It's been, a, <laughs> we've been working. I mean, one day, literally, Sophie and I drove to San Francisco and just gave tests. That's what we did. And so <laughs> we're trying to get there. Um, and so I feel confident we'll get there. Um, but as far as, uh, um, I suppose we'll talk about it in the MAC about the future of the program. But it's sort of like just as the administration, just the administrator's hope is we had 500 this year. And, I, I, you know, I keep saying this, but I'll have a better sense of where we're at once I get a budget report <laughs> where, where our allocations can be because I have to make those allocations based on the funds. But if we're in good shape, it would be my hope to at least make the goal to try to get the rest of the licensing population next year, at least in aggregate. It might not be the very same athlete, but we license roughly 1,200 professionals, uh, boxers or whatever, you know, professionals to try to get the other 700. Because we started out kind of with a, a crippled year because this year we have only had a full appropriation since July 1st because we had to stop because we ran out of money. Um, so um, with that said, uh, moving on, um, upcoming event schedule and discussion regarding event activity. Um, we have uh, some major events coming up. Um, the commissioners come to any of them. We have a Golden Boy event that's uh, on January the 27th. That's going to be a significant event. Um, okay. It's not on there. It just got added recently. I do have a question, the Pachanga yes. one on the 26th. Yes, ma'am. I thought it was maybe somewhere that it was on the 27th. Um, do we know for sure it's on the? It's the, it's, it's the Friday. Uh, it's yeah, the Friday. it's the 26th. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I saw that too. There's a typo somewhere. Yeah, it is. Okay, it where it's How at. carefully yeah. I read things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then, um, and I'll I'll come, I'll do the event activity uh, under the under the summary for the year end. Um, then I apologize. Uh, uh, we had a uh, an agenda item that actually was the posted one, and it may or may not be in your packets. And it's uh, it's it's letter F, and letter F got moved to G, and it's called staffing update. But it's totally legal because. You know, and basically, this was just my update to the commissioners that I've requested and the Department of Consumer Affairs Director, Director Filo, sent to CalHR a request to reinstate our, our Chief Athletic Inspector position. That position was removed from the 
and not just from the commission, but from the state role. It, it no longer exists, and it had been there, I believe, since 1930, somewhere like that. So it's gone now, and we're asking for it to be reestablished because it's you, one position. It's unique to the State Athletic Commission, and it's obvious what its role is, and uh, it would be nice to get that back. Yeah, as I understand, it's very important for this safety. And, and am I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to recall that we didn't staff that permit, that position for just like an interim, perhaps to save money, you know, for like a year or so, and then it just, disappeared. it was a mistake for it to disappear permanently. Yeah, I, I didn't know, no, I, I gave authorization for them to eliminate, and I agreed with the elimination of the assistant chief athletic inspector. Okay, there were two of these things, um, but the the one that had been in existence since 1930. Now, initially, when Che Guevara had that position, when Che left, I reallocated the funds to the assistant executive officer position and reestablished that. But it left that position in place. Now, since she's been um, the assistant executive, I've not filled that position. I didn't. I did it myself with Mark Rillier. Me and him's been working together on it. Um, and that position was just what you said, was to build the fund back up because as you know, in 2012, it's $23,000. So now that the fund's built back up, it makes some degree of sense um, for a lot of reasons, safety being the most important, is to bring that position back. And ideally, I think that position should be located in Southern California. That's where the fights are at. Mm -hmm. And with you up here, that would be a good balance. That's, that'd be correct, yes. Um, and then um, the, the, the last one, and uh, Heather, you want to come up here for this one. Um, this one's going to be, uh, I'm not going to bore you with a bunch of, of, of stuff, but uh, if you'll get it going. This one's called the Office and License and Field Database Demonstration. Um, so... So, as this commissioners know, the commission was audited, audited by the Bureau of State Audits in 2012, and one of the recommendations from the report stated, to ensure that it adequately tracks critical information related to its basic functions and mission, the commission should work with Consumer Affairs to ensure that the new online program will meet its needs and requirements. Once the program is in place, the commission should use it as a central means for tracking its operations. This was. This was a um, recommendation based on the commission getting the breeze system. Okay, now um, uh, that's not going to happen. Okay, um, and um, I, I was left, and 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 uh, you know, for a while we thought we were going to get it, but then we weren't getting it. But we've been working with DCA, and they've been great about modernizing our business operations and doing these type of things. But there's no off the off the shelf thing that's going to register glove size, okay, or do the things that we need it to do. We had to have something that's custom built, and and for the longest time, I couldn't figure out why in the office we ran things one way and in the field we ran things a different way. I just, it just, it just, I couldn't get that through my head. So we embarked upon this project earlier this year, actually after meeting with the department on a business modernization meeting. And, you know, I came back up and I spent, I spent time with Heather and I said, listen, this is what I want to do is I want to try to integrate the office with the field so everything's streamlined and she took the first stab at it, and she did great. Look, she did great. And I can't say enough of good things. She does great. But I nor her, and she's much better than I am, are like Excel wizards. Like, she's very good with it. But Mark Royer's wife is like, she's the best with Excel I've ever saw. And she, she took this thing, and she had made the original one for the field. She took this thing 
and I told Mark what I wanted. And I mean, months of work went into this. We're about to show it to you. Um, so what we tried to do is we tried to, um, um, the lead inspectors have been using this out in the field and if you've been to any fights, you've seen this. This is what generates our scorecards and everything else. Okay, let me click the next slide. So why we're doing it, uh, we wanted to increase the efficiency in the office uh, and the field, make the information more readily available to the promoters, okay? Um, what this is gonna allow us to do is once I set the officials in Arbiter, the, the, we, the, the office staff will be able to calculate the mileage rate based on the state rates and based on the size of the event, based on the pay scale that you guys approved three or, about three years ago, we did those revised, those three instead of the seven, which by the way is working fantastic. Um, and they're going to know how much their fees are gonna be before we get there and give them sticker shock. Okay, so that's gonna help them budget. Um, it's gonna be the uniform product for all CSAC events. So we're gonna train all the leads on this process as well as all the office staff so that we have some linear things. That way we have some degree of progression and, and we're able to fill positions like when people come in, there's one way to do it and this is it. Uh, ease of implementation for the new fiscal and policy changes. So basically if there is a mileage change or uh, you guys make some kind of policy change that we need to implement, we can do it in one place. And it's another step and look, what I've just showed you is not going to accomplish what the auditor said, but it's close and it gets us a step further towards compliance. Um, and because we're tracking the information that the, that the auditor said in one central location now, and this is being added to that, I would be happy, I, I, I think we could make a good argument that we're, once this goes into effect, we'll be in compliance. Yeah, especially because um, we don't have breeze. That, well, so we don't have we breeze. Should, we should get some wiggle room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Um, and that's just what I said. As a, we're looking for a statewide implementation on March 1st of 2018. Okay, we're in training in the office. We're going to get trained in the field. Phil's already had been trained on this. The leads got trained on it when I went down in November. We're going to be training up here uh, in January. Okay. And so here we go. So I really think you guys are going to find this find this thing really interesting. Okay, and I'm gonna let Heather show how it works. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes. All right, so basically what we integrated into the supervisor spreadsheet, which has been used to create these 17 forms that are used at each event. Yes. So previous to any of these spreadsheets that was created, it was entering data on every single form. So the lead inspector spent hours and hours doing that. Oh, these are the tubs that these inspectors would carry to every show? The packets? Yeah. So that included medicals for the athletes uh, and things like that. Okay. But yes, every form, right. okay. our, our inspector checkoff sheet, our payoff sheet, our officials, our physicians, oh, uh, suspension sheet. Oh, this is what you've been trying to integrate all these years. Right. Yes, oh, okay. Yes, ma'am. We're finally, we're finally oh, there. Okay, I mean, oh, okay. on March 1st, we're going to be there. So we have two tabs, basically, of the... 19 tabs in this Excel spreadsheet are what we use as data entry. Um, so we have for the officials, we have enter the inspectors and the referees, the judges. The this um, is what we talked about like three years ago. Yeah, look at this drop down menu. So you can actually drop down to find your referee that's working. And let's just say this, this one. This is like that sports board thing. With sort all the of. Metrics. It sure is. Sort of. Oh, oh, scoreboard. Yeah. And so this actually generates. You're able to put in who your referees are, who your judges are, and this is something that the analysts in the office can do based off of the assignments from Arbiter. And so it's already generated for the lead inspector. The only thing would be any changes or anything that comes up after it leaves the office. Um, and it. It uses the official's pay scale um, and auto creates the totals for each official. 
And so you would put their mileage in, and so their mileage plus their event pay, and then that information would go, I believe, over to the official's fee page. And just like you see here, it transferred all the information from just entering oh, on that so first good. one. And so you have a total sheet of once all of the officials are entered in that first page, you'll have a total for the promoter, at least so that they can have an idea of what their right. officials' fees are. Obviously, sometimes things change last minute, um, but they'll be able to kind of account for things a week ahead of time. Whereas this was usually done like after the weigh-in. Um, same thing with athletes. We have all the basic event information. Your event inspectors carry over from the first page. Your officials carry over from the first page, as you can see here. Um, these are your promoter required documents. This is tracking for the office. You have a drop down, yet yeah, okay or need. Um, and then over here is where we have all of the athlete information. Can you integrate medicals into this? So it's kind of hard for you to see over there, but um, the first thing obviously would be adding the athlete information. So we would add, you know, athlete one. Do the drop down. Are there all the boxes in there? Um, the yeah. athletes don't have that yet. Okay. Um, in talking with Rebecca, who, who created this, she mentioned that it's possible at some point once we start using this on a more consistent uh -huh. basis. Uh -huh to store them all in one and as a memory mm -hmm. sort of yeah mm -hmm. um so they would be tracked off of their federal or national id and essentially you could just put that in there you know auto fill the athlete their information in the last time they fought mm -hmm. the dates from like their link most it to current record or something or link, link it to mma that's ID that's the next <laughs> you could actually that do would that. be cool yeah but, like one thing one thing that was always missing is, say you had to transport the fighter. They don't necessarily have their medical, you know, the, the medicals, like the MRIs. I mean, you know that they had them, but you don't necessarily have the results of all of those things that you could transport with them to, to the hospital. We have them in the field now. Yes. You do have, but... Or the, every single fight in California Yeah, but it's like in the field. hard cop. They I mean, are. It would be great if you could have something like this that then you can send to the hospital in soft form, right? Mm -hmm. And then they don't have to be like, oh, because then your file is gone to the hospital. We yeah. scan it after, e you know, the, the packet I'm mm -hmm. talking about, and we have it in electronic format. We don't have that. I, I understand what you're saying. I think it's, I think it's great. I haven't got there just yet. Mm -hmm. um, but we do have the, you know, before we didn't, we have the medical, they're in the field now. Mm -hmm. And this commission spends, I can tell you, a lot of money on Federal Express making sure that stuff happens. Can you show them the who's who portion? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. check out this part. So this is in bout order. I don't know if you can see, but this is one. And then you'll have your rounds here. Um, so we'll say this is a six round fight. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and then you'll have your BSI, which is Boxer Severity Index, yep. or the MMASI, as it starts being used. Yep. Um, That's so cool. And then just like the who's who. <coughs> right, tickle my throat. Um, um, it doesn't do that. Can you can you hide the combs? They do it. Can you tell them where to hide the combs? <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Who? Okay. So this, I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with what a who's who looks like, but it. It's basically a spreadsheet of all of the athletes fighting on the card mm -hmm. and the dates of their medicals um, that are required to fight. So we have their federal ID, the expiration date of that, their date of birth, the application, <coughs> their fee, 
your picture, physical, eye exam, neuro MRI, EKG, and blood. Um, and so once you enter the athlete information into this cell, it'll transfer all of you know, all of the bouts over to the. And and Heather, let me just I don't mean to interrupt, but no. can you go back to the who's who for a minute? Just yes. the, 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 the who's who <coughs> portion. Okay, so back back to all those medicals where they're at. Okay, those medicals um, we built this, and you know the implementation date's not until a while, and we obviously can change the formulas. But this was built with the last MAC meeting, that examination of boxer applicants. It was built with those numbers. Okay, where the MAC made those changes. So, um, okay, this one's the one that we're showing you is current. Okay, but we can change them back. Right. Okay, and we had the one that we're working on there in the office that has the ones where it's based off of, and they're easy to change. So you see how it says Nero 15 months and MRI five years. Okay, mm -hmm. so we have one that we're working off of that'll say Nero 12 months, mm -hmm. MRI three years. Okay, based off of the max recommend. It's just it's just the little detail that I thought you'd see. So cool. con continue here. And that same thing goes for official fees. Gate, uh, gate taxes. If anything were to change with that, it's really simple. Um, change in this database right over here, and you could. What, let's say that changes to four hundred. Changes it on every page, so you have your officials pay. Over here, <clears throat> it'll change it right there, and then transfer over to the officials pay sheet as well. Okay, and can you show them the other tabs? Just quickly. Sure. So that's the bout sheet. You guys, I know you've been to fights. You see that thing often. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then, you, then you've got the inspector memorandum. I know you've been to fights. You've seen that. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, then the payoff sheet. Everybody's seen that. Mm -hmm. Official fees. Everybody's seen that. Mm -hmm. Show payment sheet. That keeps our money tracked. Box office report. Okay, credential list, physician report, master sheets, inspector sign in, inspector check off. That's for our, like our gloves. Notice the things on there, wraps, gloves, tape, all that type of stuff. Remember when we got audited and we couldn't verify, we couldn't document that, remember this? Yeah. Here we go. Okay. So at the event, the lead inspector will have a laptop and will be inputting all this? It's already done. Well, no, they will input the part in the office that they can okay. and then sh send this to the lead and then only the lead will know about like sometimes the bout order changes right. and sometimes right. so after the weigh-in they go home at night or, or whenever the weigh-in they go home at the, and they update it and fix it and then they print off all these things they use a lot of ink they come in with all the papers and then like the the blue corner inspector and the red corner inspector will have these and they're responsible for this and they'll make sure that all these things are done then they sign it and i know it's just like documentation but we did get audited about it and now we'll have it okay be more efficient more efficient yes i just wanted to add because i really liked this part of the spreadsheet uh, where the office staff enter in the athlete medicals they plug in dates of when that medical was done. And what I liked is, because we're only human and we make mistakes, when they plug that date in, rather than the staff having to calculate, okay, this, this particular medical is only good for 15 months mm -hmm. or 12 months, mm -hmm. they plug the date in and this, that spreadsheet will tell them whether it's a valid yeah, medical or not. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it kind of like captures. Double check, right? Mm -hmm. It's a double check, mm -hmm. exactly. So if it passes then for that whatever reason, I mean, we have sold me. <laughs> yeah, we're working on. Yeah, numbers, months, right? Months, <laughs> and, you know, we have a month in advance, and you're thinking today is the date or next week right. is good. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, if you are working on one like we, we get the Golden Boy fight cards. They're like working two on two months in advance, yeah, uh -huh. and so, they're working on four or five cards at one time, yeah. Yeah. and so yeah. they're juggling all these dates. Uh -huh. So when they plug it in here, it just lets them know, oh, you know what? 
this is an invalid MRI. Instead of catching right. it on the back end. Super, yeah, super, yeah. super. So time. So <laughs> yes, excellent. Very cool. Um, so that, I guess that's it. Um, that's the chain and that's the judge's sheet. And so that, that really is, um, thank, thank you, Heather. That, that concludes our, um, Vice Chair, uh, uh, Madam Chair, I've been informed by our legal counsel that the Deputy Director of Legal Affairs has informed him and I'm informing, he's informed me and I'm informing you that because we've lost our quorum, we have to end the meeting. Okay. Can we just have the meeting with no voting? Uh, no. Apparently not. Apparently, at least according to my supervisor, uh, states that that is still considered a transaction of business. Okay. A what fashion of business? Transaction. Transaction oh. of business. Mm. What happened to what So happened all to I had happened? left was a PowerPoint, and I'll just email it to you. Yeah, it's, it's just the regulation handbook. Um, so. I think that's important. I think we, we should have this presentation at our next meeting, although this is not a meeting well, can't you just informally. Tell us about it but because this is important. I mean, people aren't here. I think other people on the commission need to see this. It's beautiful. It's just beautiful. Sure. So beautiful. I, let, let's carry it over. Okay. Yes, yes ma'am. You did great work. I know the whole office did great work. If you could still email the PowerPoint, that'd be great. Yes, sir. I will. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, can you tell us what we're carrying over to the next meeting? Okay. That's okay. Okay, I'm in the chair. We'll do that. Um, so we did not uh, come to the Business and Professions Code 18640 to invite stakeholder testimony to identify actions lead to greater opportunities. So we didn't do that. Um, and we didn't do the, um, the year in commission summary, which I guess this is what this is, yeah? We didn't do the okay. point. And we didn't do the 10 point plan. And we didn't do. And we didn't do the um, public comment. And we didn't. And we did the meeting dates. And we didn't do this very beautiful regulatory yeah. handbook. But we'll, we'll talk about which that next. Took months to prepare. See how pretty it is? Yeah. <laughs> um, Andy, can you. Um, the meeting dates, can you just make sure that gets sent out to all the commissioners in a separate email yes, for the upcoming? I just don't want anyone yes, get on everyone's. The next and meeting, if, if I mean, yeah. we can't really right. vote on it. We're not being filmed anymore, are we? Yeah, okay. Okay, so I now call the meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone.